if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Johnny Gosh series. I am, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire. We are on episode four, Jeff Gannon. And this was quite the story a number of years back on whether or not Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. And not only that, regardless of whether he is or he isn't Johnny Gosh, how did he get his White House credentials? What is up with his history of uh, male escort websites and then all of a sudden he's, he's a White House uh, journalist with White House credentials? And what is up with his shady background that can't be verified? So again, whether he is or he isn't Johnny Gosh, I mean, there's some serious questions regarding Jeff Gannon. Now, if he is Johnny Gosh, can that be proven? And what are we to make of this deep-rooted conspiracy within the upper echelons of corrupt politicians and corrupt establishments that the Dunning-Kruger crowd, the coincidence theorists, the authority-worshipping cultists who refuse to believe they're too mentally weak to even consider the possibility that maybe former FBI head Ted Gunderson is not a complete moron and maybe that Paul Bonacci got a $1 million judgment in his case for his own child abuse, exploitation, and trafficking, that that judge is not a complete moron and the evidence was was sufficient enough to give him a $1 million judgment verifying Bonacci's story, or at least certain parts of his story, of being a human trafficking victim and part of this ring in these corrupt establishments, particularly in the Des Moines area, in Iowa, but also supposedly a far-reaching conspiracy going all the way to the White House. So in typical mind-shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront, instead of hallucinations and blind faith in the corrupt with horrible track records, we will be diving into the Jeff Gannon angle in this uh, very, very daunting case, tragic case, haunting case that's just incredibly disturbing. I mean, not only that politicians and there's these corrupt bankers and all of these scum would be involved in harming children, but the clueless goofs who deny that it's even a possibility. I mean, it's really, really weird. On Mindshock, we don't claim anything is true or untrue. We just follow the evidence in as objective a fashion as possible. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, find it interesting and informative, want to help support the podcast, want to help us get awareness out there in some of these cold cases, unsolved cases, and corruption exposés, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, and like and share on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patreon do get a priority for case topic logical analysis co podcast requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right, we are going to start off with MSNBC and Jeff Gannon's appearance and what he had to say about this whole debacle, and then we will deconstruct from there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Deedle and Daniel Show. This is a story 20 years in the, 23 years in the making. On our first show, we told you about a missing Iowa boy, Johnny Gosh. He was kidnapped back in 1982. His mother, Noreen, was here to tell her side of the story. You are obsessed with the story, I know. Today, we have the man who may know what happened to little Johnny. Some claim that former White House reporter Jeff Gannon may actually be the missing boy. So right now, let's take a look back at how the story got started. Johnny Gosh vanished from his West Des Moines, Iowa neighborhood without a trace. The newspaper delivery boy was on his morning route when he disappeared. One theory, the boy was kidnapped sexually abused, sold into a child sex slavery ring, and brainwashed by the CIA. Some claim Gosh was snatched for the Monarch Project, a government-sponsored mind and behavioral control program designed to create top-secret escorts. The story then picks up in 2005. 
The internet was abuzz with word that former White House reporter Jeff Gannon may in fact be Johnny Gosh. The claim, based on similar body markings and a lack of information about Gannon's early years. We have looked into uh, some records that came from Pennsylvania where uh, Mr. Gannon slash Guckert supposedly went to high school. Um, we've looked at photographs and, and some of them match, some of them don't. There's, uh, there's several photographs that, that look strikingly like Johnny Gosh and there are, there are some that don't even look like him at all. In February, Gannon was exposed. His name, actually James Gucker, a man with no journalism experience whatsoever, who had links to several gay escort services online. And joining us right now from Davie, Florida, the man at the center of the controversy. You're looking at him, former White House reporter Jeff Gannon, who watched our show and Bo's interview and wanted to come on and chat, and we appreciate that, sir. So, uh, Jeff, here's what Noreen Gosh said on our last show. Let's listen, and then I'm going to ask you to react. I do not know if Gannon is Johnny or not. Only a DNA test would provide that information conclusively. Jeff, one question for you. Let's get right to the point. Are you willing to take a DNA test and settle the controversy once and for all? Yes Abs or no? Absolutely, I would definitely take a DNA test, but that isn't even necessary because there's so much evidence to uh, available to disprove these accusations. That's a yes, then. Well, you are well he's saying yes. My friend Jeff yeah, is saying yes. You know what? Yes. As a lawyer, I can, I can, smell, right. I can smell a No, hit. no, 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 no. you so. got to understand something. My friend here, Jeff, who's come on our show today, didn't do anybody else's show, he's going to tell us the fact. Jeff, how old are you first off? I'm, I'm 48 years 48 old. 48 years old. My man Johnny Gashi there would be 35 years old. Lisa, Why the are you numbers, avoiding the question? The, no, 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 no. He just said, he just said, hey, Jeff. You said you would take a DNA. I could set this whole thing up, but let's get to the point. Let's get to the point. The point is, by giving a DNA sample, there could be opening up some other avenues of things that I kind of know that you possibly could be involved. And I don't knock it. Again, if you want to go suck on a Johnny Pump or whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, you could do in this world. But the point is, Why all we're here for, speak, all Let we're here speak. for is to show that my friend Jeff is not Johnny Gosh. Jeff? There are dozens of people who have known me most of my life that uh, could uh, definitely vouch for the fact that I am not this person. Look, what happened to this, this child and the, the suffering that his mother has endured is, is a tragedy. But it's also uh, been very difficult for, for me and my family, my real mother and, and, and members of my family, who have had to uh, listen to these uh, fabrications being spread uh, in newspapers, on television, and uh, on the Internet. All right, so I'm going to ask you a question, not Bo. Jeff, are you willing <laughs> to take a DNA test, yes or no? Yes uh, or no? Yes. When I cut my finger yesterday, there was plenty of DNA available. You should have stopped by. What else you want, Lisa? Are the you man? his lawyer? No, excuse me. Let excuse me. Speak. He's my friend, my friend Jeff down here. Jeff, thank you for coming on the show again. You know what we're doing here? All this conspiracy stuff on the blogs, on all these Internets, what we're doing is we're cutting to the chase. Now. Again, again... I don't understand why, you know, and you said it to me over the phone and you said that you feel sorry for Noreen. Uh, you feel sorry for her missing her son and you wouldn't put her through if you were her son. And you're you said you're 40. In his mouth, he says though. he's Jeff, 40. Let's hear from him. What did you think when you saw Noreen? Gosh, let him speak. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. I feel that that this woman is being used by people who are trying to promote themselves as being investigators when they're not. They're fabricators. They're, uh, they've defamed me and put this woman through, uh, through unnecessary pain, uh, giving her hope where, where it, uh, it doesn't exist. Jeff, you tell them. And I'm going to tell you something right now, Jeff. If we, we want to shut everybody's mouths up, I'll arrange with you a little DNA, give me a little blood, a little survive, saliva, whatever you want to do, and then we'll get a little from Noreen, and we'll see, and we'll show them it doesn't match, and then everyone will keep their mouths shut and let you get on with your life. Because as far as I'm concerned, whatever you do in your life, if it's not a crime involved, whatever you want to be involved with, I don't really care. What I care about is people making up stories about other people and letting, making you live now on the edge of your life. Here's my question. Jeff, have you reached out to Noreen? What have you told her? I, I have not been in communication with this woman uh, because I can't uh, determine whether some of the emails I'm getting are actually this woman or not. There, there are hundreds of people that are contacting me about this story. I have no idea who they are. 
nameless, faceless people making wild accusations. Do you have a pen and paper? Because I can give you her phone number oh. right after the show. Bo, are you, you on know, a payroll? No, I'm not on a payroll. But when a guy is falsely accused, you got to stand up for, for innocent people. You're an attorney. You understand that, too. The man is going to give his DNA. The man is 48 years old. Johnny Gosh would be 35 years old. He looks 48 years old. I'm 54 years old. He looks 48 years old. Why can't the guy be telling the truth? How about we talk about Gannon Gate? Jeff. Are you on any type of payroll, White House, oh. Republican? <clears throat> absolutely, absolutely not. Never, never. I have been in the past or, or now. Have, can you understand why people would think that you're not always telling the truth? Your name isn't what you said it was. Then the liberal blogs come out and say that there's a different story. You resign. Not that there's anything wrong with it. But can you see that people may not know that you're telling the truth here? Well, I, I think uh, people who are listening to nameless, faceless people making accusations on the Internet, I'm sitting here in front of uh, your cameras today to, uh, to answer your questions. Where are these people? These people hide behind screen names mm -hmm. on the Internet. I'm here. I'm willing to give the evidence and tell my side of the story. Frankly, I haven't had the opportunity to tell my side of the story. Any time that I've made appearances, people have... Uh, uh, protested my appearance, tried to shout me down. I had to go six on one uh, two weeks ago right. at, at one event. Uh, it's it's my turn. Why don't people believe Jeff, me Jeff, as opposed to some of these your other friend people? Bo, your friend Bo Dito believes you. I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today and clearing this thing up. We'll do this DNA thing, and I'll make my friend Lisa here see that you are, in fact, who you say you are. And Noreen Gosh, we did invite to come on to the show, but she refused. I want to thank Jeff Gannon and his lawyer, Bo Dito, for coming on the show. Okay, so, wow, Dito, what a complete obnoxious buffoon. I mean, does this guy have a mental disability or something? He doesn't even let the guy speak, and he pre he presupposes he's innocent. Like, he made it perfectly clear he's not here to find out the truth. He's here to dispel any accusation which he already assumed and hallucinated was definitively false in the direction of Jeff Gannon. Despite Jeff Gannon's name being, I mean, how many names does this guy have? Came out of nowhere, how did he get his White House credentials? Like, all these things that are shady regarding Gannon, he's calling him his friend, etc. And what's hilarious is that Daniel, she calls this buffoon out on it. It's like, is he on some kind of payroll? Because that's what it looks like. <laughs> I mean, this didle goof. I mean, this, is, this guy is such a buffoon. I mean, how does he have his own show? This is crazy. But... Anyway, what did we notice about Jeff Gannon? The first thing I noticed is he refused to say Johnny Gosh's name or even Noreen Gosh's name. So he's trying to depersonalize this as much as possible. Why? Would someone who's not Gosh and has no emotional connection to him, why would there be this desperate need to depersonalize? Now, the other thing that's very alarming is Gannon's blinking rate. Now, his, I mean, his blinking is completely out of control. So whether he is or he isn't Johnny Gosh, it seems very possible he has been a victim of some kind of uh, brainwashing or mind control experiments. I mean, his, his micro expressions here just do not seem natural. And neither does his blink rate, especially if he's not Gosh and he's not connected to any kind of uh, shady dealings. Like, if he's a 100% law-abiding citizen with no shady history, why, why would he be like this? It's really weird. So, let's just do a quick aside here. We're going to go to Business Insider with FBI agent Mark Boughton. FBI agent of 30 years who wrote the book How to Spot Lies Like the FBI. This was published here January 11th, 2019 by Rachel Gillette and Samantha Lee. You can tell someone's lying to you by watching their face. Here are 12 dead giveaways. Just about everyone you know tells low-stake lies. But some people even go so far as to lie about important matters that could forever change their relationships, end their employment, or even send them to jail. Detecting high-stakes liars is often the work of the FBI, and they frequently look to facial expressions, body language, and verbal indicators as signals or tells that someone is lying. And it's really funny, too, because a, a lot of the Dunning-Kruger crowd, these, like, clueless goofs who think micro-expressions are all BS and you can't tell how someone's lying, just because, I mean, yes, a small percentage of the population that are good liars or sociopaths or whatever, they might not have these giveaways. But that doesn't mean that micro-expressions aren't scientific and that they 
they aren't tells. But for whatever reason, a lot of these clueless goofs hallucinate that uh, it's 100% fraud, like fake and fraud, like, like psychics or something, which is another can of worms. But anyway, continuing on here... Mark Bowton, an FBI agent of 30 years and author of How to Spot Lies with the FBI, tells Business Insider that he used certain tells to help identify Timothy McVeigh as a suspect in the Oklahoma City bombing. But, and of course, that's different from him acting alone, which, yeah, a lot of people have actually asked for an Oklahoma City uh, mind shock episode. Uh, that one might have to be for the Rumble channel. I don't know if YouTube uh, would be happy with, uh, with the search for the truth in that particular case. But being able to read facial expressions to detect lies can be beneficial even if you're not conducting criminal investigations, he says. There are a number of facial expressions and associated reactions that could indicate someone is lying to you, he says. Some are caused by nervousness, some by chemical reactions, and others by physical reactions. Now, let's keep in mind here. Gannon is a White House reporter used to being on camera asking rapid-fire questions of high-profile politicians. So this is not some guy that, like, works in some kind of cubicle that's never, that's the first time on the news, first time in front of an audience, first time speaking, in which case that could theoretically justify some kind of nervousness. So let's keep that in mind as well. To start, he says it's important to understand how the person in question normally acts. It's best to observe someone for a while as you make small talk or ask innocuous questions in order to see what his usual reactions are, including tics he may have, he says. Then if he exhibits several lying indicators when you ask more pointed or suggestive questions, and these are not the ones he previously performed, you can be confident that he's likely lying. Here are some things you can do to tell if someone's lying. Watch their eyes. Eyes darting back and forth. People's eyes usually dart back and forth when they feel uncomfortable. Now again uncomfortable doesn't mean lying they just are uncomfortable and make of that which will this is a, a physiological reaction to him feeling uncomfortable or trapped by qu your questions that he doesn't want to answer Bouton says it's a throwback to when people had to seek an escape route when they feared they were in a dangerous situation such as facing a human or animal adversary and here's another point if Gannon is that uncomfortable why would he even go on the show to talk about this? Unless either someone forced him to. But again, if he's not Johnny Gosh, why would he be that uncomfortable? And again, I'm not alleging he is or he isn't. I'm just trying to discern. Because maybe he isn't Johnny Gosh, but he is involved in some kind of shady dealings at the White House or possibly even human trafficking operations or some kind of mind control experiments, whatever. But why would he be... For I mean, it's just weird how, how he would go on the show regardless of that as well. But anyway... Keep an eye out for rapid blinking. Rapid blinking. When people are stressed about lying, they may blink five or six times in rapid succession. So it's not just lying, but they're lying and they're stressed about it. So, for example, some kind of sociopathic serial killer, they might be perfectly happy to lie and they wouldn't be stressed about lying. So they could just lie to your face all day long and not excessive or rapid blink. Because they're not stressed about their lying, they're, they're, they're comfortable with it. So Jeff Gannon here, he seems highly stressed. Now, is it stressed about lying specifically? Or is it stressed about something else and other connections? Either way, he seems highly stressed and agitated and some kind of lying involved. A person will ordinarily blink about five or six times a minute. Or once every 10 or 12 seconds. Bouton says, when stressed, for instance, when someone knows he's lying, he may blink five or six times in rapid succession. And that's exactly what we see here with Gannon. Bouton says exceptions to the usual blink rate mostly have to do with the production of dopamine in the body. For example, a person with Parkinson's will have a noticeably slower blink rate than what is usual. While a person with schizophrenia will blink more rapidly than normal. And again, compare it to when Gannon is not answering a question. He seems to be sitting there calmly without excessive blinking. It's only when he's speaking on this matter that he goes into excessive blinking mode. Count how long someone closes their eyes. Closing eyes for more than one second at a time. People often close their eyes for more than a second at a time when they're lying. Bounton says that when a person closes his eyes for a second or two, he may indicate he's lied to you, since this is a type of defense mechanism. Normally, he says a person will blink at a speed of 100 to 400 milliseconds, or 0.1 to 0.4 of a second. Pay attention to the direction they look. 
up, looking up to the right. Right-handed people usually look up to the right when they're about when they're about what they saw. When you ask a normal right-handed person about something he's supposed to have seen, if he looks upward and to his left, he's usually accessing his memory of the incident, Batten says. However, if he looks upward and to his right, he's assessing his imagination and he's inventing an answer. Bounton says that left-handed people will usually have just the opposite reactions, and some people will stare straight ahead when trying to recall a visual memory, he says. And I have to jump in here because there's a very important caveat here to establish the control, because that might be true for, let's say, 80% of the population, 70-80%, but there's a decent percentage that do the opposite right-handed or they do the opposite of what was just stated here so that's why you need to ask them a definitive question so you could, that that's easy that you know is true so you could see which way they look when they're telling the truth not to just jump at them with try to figure out if they're lying or not because uh you know even 10 percent of the population i mean out of a country of hundreds of millions of people that that's millions and millions of people that will have the opposite of this so that's not, you know, yes, you could say the majority of people do that, but you really have to establish. Take note of what you're asking them, looking directly to the right. Right-handed people normally look directly to the right when they're lying about what they heard. And again, that's something that's individual more. If you ask a person about what a person heard, the eyes will shift to his left ear to recollect the sound he heard, but if his eyes shift towards his right, he's about to fib, Bouton says. The key is what they're trying to recall, looking down to the right. Right-handed people often look down into the right when they're lying about smells or sensations. His eyes will shift downward and to his left if he's going to tell you his memory of a smell or touch or sensation, such as a cold draft or a terrible odor, Bouton explains. But his eyes will shift down and to his right if he's going to lie. Bunched skin beneath and wrinkles beside the eyes indicate a real smile. A false smile doesn't affect the eyes, and it's just done with the mouth. Bouton says that when people genuinely smile, the skin around their eyes bunch and wrinkle. And you can clearly see Gannon's false smile here after mentioning the DNA test. Uh, and of course, he never actually did take a DNA test. So, But before we get back to that... Watch their hands as well. Face touching. People's faces often itch when they lie. Touching one's face may indicate lying. And again, this is so individualistic. And then, of course, there are now, you also have to factor X percentage of the time there will be an itch. So, regardless of whether they're lying or not. So, this one's a little tougher unless they're excessively itching only when answering certain types of questions and they're not itching at all for long stretches of time on the questions that they're answering truthfully. Bouton explains that a chemical reaction causes people's faces to itch when they lie. And keep an eye on what they do with their mouth, purse lips. People may purse their lips to counteract the dry mouth that comes with lying. Again, that dry mouth is because they're nervous. So a sociopathic serial killer wouldn't be nervous about killing people or lying about it. So again, just keeping all that in mind. A person's mouth will often go dry as she's lying. Bouton says this may do a sucking motion, pursing her lips to try to overcome this. When their lips are so tightened that they appear pinched and white, this can indicate lying. Take note of any excessive sweating. Excessive sweating. People who are lying will often perspire more than is usual for the conditions. Bouton says sweat may appear on the forehead, cheeks, or back of the neck, and you'll likely observe the person try to wipe it away. And in some instances, notice when the person blushes. Blushing, some people, usually women, will blush after lying. Blushing is an involuntary reflex caused by sympathetic nervous system. This activates your fight or flight response and is a response to the release of adrenaline. Pay attention to which direction they shake their head. So what is your name and what do you do? I'm Jeff Gannon. I uh, am a writer. I'm currently working on a book about my experience as a White House reporter. And where are you from originally? I grew up in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania in a rural area. Oh, really? Um, what was it like growing up there? It was... Uh, a perfect upbringing. I, was, I had, uh, went to a good school, had a great family, uh, lots of friends, uh, great opportunities. Um, Western Pennsylvania, I was talking to someone in one of my past interviews and they said that West, Western Pennsylvania 
is very much Midwest oriented, like the the yes. way people think and whatnot yes. is very Midwest. Whereas Eastern Pennsylvania is very New England, so you fall into like the Midwest. Midwest absolutely, Midwestern <laughs> value set. But uh, one of the things I've maintained from the start is uh, the important things to know about me. I am an independent conservative journalist. Uh, I, I always was, and I always will be. And my personal life has no impact on that whatsoever. And frankly, it's nobody's darn business. And uh, all the things that have been uh, written about me, uh, posted on the internet, there's so much misinformation out there. I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to pick through it and tell you, well, this is, this is true, this is not true. So as a matter of course, I just don't deal with it. You know, I learned early on that you can't, uh, you can't keep people from saying things, can't keep people from posting these things on the internet. Uh, so I just don't. You know, people are going to say what they're going to say, and uh, I'm, I will eventually be able to present myself uh, in, to people in the way that they need to see me. Head shaking. If people shake their heads while saying something, they've just denied their statement. I mean, this is actually prevalent. Um, Amanda Knox actually does this a lot. Not necessarily about whether she, you know, w whether or not she was the actual killer, but where she was and her movements. She, uh, th there was some clear indications of lying in, in a lot of her interviews. If you haven't checked out the Amanda Knox podcast on Mindshock, make sure you check that out. Often when people tell the truth, they will nod their heads simultaneously in agreement with what they're saying. But if they shake their heads in disagreement with what they've just said, their bodies are betraying their lie. That's their subconscious. Okay, so clearly we have some excessive, excessive tells here regarding Jeff Gannon. And of course, you know, again, with this goof, with this didal goof, he thinks someone claims, says, someone verbally states they're a certain age. Oh, case closed! <laughs> I mean, this guy, I mean, this Didal goof is, this is one of the goofiest bastards I have ever seen in my entire life. I've, luckily, I've never watched this show. I don't have no clue who he is before I watch this little clip here, luckily. But this guy is among the goofiest of goofs. I mean, he could vie for some Dunning-Kruger championships. Because this guy is so dumb here. Someone tells him he's a certain... He didn't even provide his ID. He just verbally told him he's a certain age. Oh, case closed! It was a false accusation. It was a conspiracy. <laughs> and if this guy... If there is a conspiracy, obviously, how easy is it to fake documents and change the age by a couple years? It's not like he's 50 years off. I mean, yeah, he's a number of years off, but he also happens to look exactly like Johnny Gosh. I mean, the similarity is uncanny. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean, I, I wouldn't use it as proof because th there's a lot of people that look very similar to other people. So I wouldn't say that's undeniable, but the markings on the body, I mean, we'll get to that. But I just wanted to lay the foundation with the interview here just so people can kind of get an idea, get a sentiment of what this Jeff Gannon character is about. And I still don't even know why he appeared on the show, because again, with all these micro-expressions and tells, he's clearly lying about a lot. Now, whether he's lying about being Johnny Gosh, that's, you know, up to debate, of course. So, in the discussion here, on the conspiracy subreddit just one year ago or so, Vina Cute posted uh, this this clip that we just watched. What happened to the Jeff Gannon conspiracy? Do you guys remember this story? Gay prostitute fakes his way into the White House, or allegedly fakes, I mean, who knows if he was, if he's part of some kind of MK Ultra experiment and he was placed there, under a fake news agency, gets busted by another journalist, story gets huge, then completely disappears. Pictures of him and George Bush. How did he get that job? Who put him there? Is he actually Johnny Gosh, the once kidnapped boy from Iowa? Now, here's the thing, too. I mean, you have Gosh with George Bush kissing his head and all this weird stuff. There's also this old photo of George Bush with this supposedly as of yet unidentified young boy who happens to look exactly like Johnny Gosh as well. I mean, what do all the coincidence theorists make of this? Because this isn't just a guy who looks like the older version of Gosh. We have another boy who happens to look like Johnny Gosh who's also photographed with George Bush. And then if you checked out the previous episode of the Mindshock Johnny Gosh series, there's the Colorado area where Bonacci claims that he and Gosh were taken in this Colorado ranch 
in a general vicinity of areas tied to Tweet Kimball, this ranch owner who's friends with none other than the Bush family. So, I mean, the coincidence stack is so stratospheric here. I mean, I just, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, what do all the coincidence theorists and corruption deniers think about this? Vina Cute also posted this. Let's keep this thread going. Really curious about what happened to the story. Post what you can find. This was the news agency he worked for at the time, Talon News. You can see that Talon News is owned by Endeavor Media Group. Is this a fake company? Endeavor Media Group is a company with a P.O. box and a fake phone number listing. When checking on EndeavorMediaGroup.com on who is, the same info comes up, but EndeavorMediaGroup.com is a forbidden domain. Also, when Googling Endeavor Group Media, Endeavor Media Group in February 2005, it got you nothing. It's like this company didn't exist. And it didn't until Monday, February 7, 2005. Huh. That's weird. And that's in Herndon, Virginia, near the Pentagon. So other people stated here, uh, he was on the White House guest register over 200 times. So this wasn't just one or two instances. Okay, now before we go further down the rabbit hole, let's, uh, let's go to a really, really mind-shocking article here, December 15, 2012, on clandestineragerevealed.wordpress.com. This is pretty crazy. Johnny Gosh, a rare survivor. Found this article on Facebook earlier this month. It pissed me off to no end. There are many people lecturing, writing, and appearing in person to disclose MK Ultra. Only a few of the writers will discuss what is happening to the children. This person at Blogspot did an ex incredible job of putting this phenomenal article together about Johnny Gosh on pedophileringilluminati.blogspot.com. This article is no longer up. Okay. But the, it, it's been reposted here on clandestineragereveal.wordpress.com. Okay. So originally the article was written October 24th, 2009, Johnny Gosh, a rare survivor. And this, this is really, really crazy stuff. So we're going to get into some of the occult angles and, and all of that that Ted Gunderson blew the whistle on before. But this will set the stage for more Gannon coincidences. I mean, the amount of coincidences connected to the name Gannon itself. I mean, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. On Sunday, September 6, 1982, in the bedroom community of West Des Moines, Iowa, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh is headed out on his newspaper route. He brings with him his family dog and his red wagon to carry the papers. This is the last time Johnny is ever seen again. Johnny's parents, Noreen and John Gosh, Sr., launched the initial search for their son because the West Des Moines police were short-staffed due to the Labor Day weekend. Noreen knew in her heart that her son had not run away from home, as the police suspected, but he had been abducted by a stranger. Because both the Goshes were asleep when Johnny left that house that morning, there is conflicting information on what he was wearing that day. Their best guess was either dark sweatpants or a white t-shirt with blue jean cutoffs. Another newspaper boy named Mike tells police that a stocky man in a 1979 or 1980 blue two-tone, two-door Ford Fairmont with Iowa plates had been driving around that morning asking the newspaper boys for directions. Johnny told Mike that the man made him feel uncomfortable when he asked him for directions. As the boys noticed the Fairmont circling the area again, Johnny said he was heading home. Mike watched Johnny walking down the street and noticed another man he hadn't seen before walking closely behind Johnny as he turned the corner. A police artist creates a composite sketch of the stocky, dark, complected man seen driving the car. Witnesses describe him in his 30s with a mustache. The sketch is released to the media, but nothing solid comes from the lead. Days turn into weeks, and weeks bled into months. Noreen becomes obsessed with finding her son. Every night, she leaves her porch light on. She does numerous television interviews, hoping that Johnny will see her and know that help is on the way. Usually, when a child is abducted, he's not seen or heard from again, but in the years following Johnny's disappearance, there were sightings, evidence, and bizarre coincidences. And to this very Every day, many believe Johnny was the victim of a bizarre and insidious plot and is still alive and in hiding. Soon after his abduction, Johnny was drugged, molested, sold, and prostituted. This was not a random kidnapping. Johnny was clearly targeted. On September 19th, 1982, Michael Aquino purchases Johnny for $35,000. They travel to Colorado to a house near Sedalia in the vicinity of Elephant Rock and Jar Canyon. 
This house was shown on one of America's most wanted programs broadcast in 1992, where Johnny begins a program of torture, mind control, and prostitution. Aquino is a military intelligence officer with ties to the CIA's mind control branch. He has the contacts, resources, and motivation to head an organization of criminals that kidnap children and transform them into sex slaves to satisfy his own personal mental illness while disguising the operation under the umbrella of national security. On August 12, 1984, two years after Johnny disappeared, 12-year-old Eugene Martin, another paperboy for the Des Moines Register, disappears while on his newspaper route. Noreen Gosh receives information another paperboy will be abducted prior to Martin's disappearance and reports it to local police. They call her crazy and disregard the tip. The FBI jumps on the Martin case immediately, but like Johnny, it's as though Eugene has disappeared without a trace. On August 16th, President Reagan phones the editor of the Des Moines Register, James Gannon. So, yeah, James Gannon. Now, keep in mind, Jeff Gannon, supposed original name, is James Gucker, James Dale Gucker. The West Des Moines, the, the Des Moines Register editor is James Gannon. So, Jeff Gannon, formerly James Gucker, the editor, James Gannon. Gannon. Swap first and last names. Does anybody find that strange? And Gannon itself, I mean, it's not like Gannon is like Smith or Johnson. I mean, Gannon is not that common of a name. I actually cannot recall ever knowing anybody with the last name Gannon. I mean, I've probably seen it somewhere, not relation to this case, once in a blue moon, but this is not a po super popular last name. Mm. What does everybody make of that? But continuing the story here, Des Moines Register, okay, so President Reagan phones the editor of the Des Moines Register, James Gannon, and asks what, if anything, he can do to help in the disappearance of the two boys. To date, authorities have been unable to positively link these two cases. For the next two years, there are sightings of Johnny all over the U.S., including a dollar bill, which shows up in Sioux City, Iowa. Written on the front of the currency is, I am alive, dash, Johnny Gosh. Then on Valentine's Day, 1988, a typed letter arrives at the Gosh home. It's postmarked Idaho. The writer says he's Johnny, and he's been kidnapped and forced to do terrible things. He says his kidnappers have dyed his hair and given him a new name. He types at the end of the letter, Your son, Johnny Gosh. The note also mentions the incident in Oklahoma where Johnny approached a woman for help. According to Noreen, that tip was also never made public, which validates for her that the letter is authentic. Johnny Gosh was here, was painted in red nail polish on the bathroom wall of a restaurant in Denver, Colorado. In 1989, 21-year-old Paul Bonacci, a convicted child molester, comes forward. While serving time in an Omaha, Nebraska prison for molesting a young boy, Bonacci admitted to his psychiatrist he helped abduct Iowa newspaper boy Johnny Gosh. He claimed there was an organized ring of pedophiles in Omaha that abducts children and forces them into a life of pornography and prostitution, and in some cases, auctions off these children to clients for sex. Bonacci, who suffers from a multiple personality disorder, had been a key witness in Omaha's Franklin Federal Credit Union Bank scandal. He testified that Larry E. King, who was charged and convicted with embezzling $40 million from the bank, had wild sex parties at his home, and Bonacci himself had sex with several prominent Omaha citizens who were there. Larry E. King was a major Republican fundraiser based in Omaha and sang the national anthem at both the 84 and 88 Republican conventions. Bonacci claimed that he and others were taken to the Republican convention in Dallas and also made numerous trips to the King's Washington, D.C. apartment in Embassy Row where they were offered up for sex for pay with prominent Republican politicians. Bonacci claims that this organized ring picked him up at the age of eight and forced him into prostitution. He says he was photographed, blackmailed, and later forced to be a decoy to lure young boys like Johnny into waiting vehicles. Bonacci admits that he became a molester himself. Bonacci's attorney, John DeCamp, phoned the Goshes with his story, and the Goshes' private investigator, Roy Stevens, spent two years trying to disprove Bonacci's claims. Because Bonacci had been charged with perjury and perpetrating a hoax by the grand jury in the Franklin Credit scandal, neither the FBI nor the West Des Moines police would even interview him about the Gosh case. They still feel he's an un un unreliable witness. Now, by the way, he did get a $1 million judgment. Now, those case files are sealed, for obvious reasons, for those that believe in the conspiracy. But why is he being awarded million-dollar judgments by judges if he has no evidence or he's not credible? In the two years, Roy Stevens investigated Bonacci. I mean, if anything, 
I mean, you have to think the evidence and his testimony must have been so overwhelming because he's already painted as a perjurer and unreliable witness. So the amount of evidence he would have to produce would be well in excess of someone who's not up, who hasn't been looked at as a perjurer, uh, you know, so an unreliable with mental health issues. So one can only imagine what is in those sealed files that is so definitive that he was awarded this million dollar judgment. In the two years Roy Stevens investigated Bonacci, he went from skeptic to supporter. And some of Bonacci's story and the evidence Roy Stevens uncovered is compelling. Emilio is the ringleader of the organization with, who orders the abductions and sells the children to the pedophiles. Bonacci claims Emilio was the man in the Ford Fairmont asking Johnny for directions. Tony is used as the driver. Remarkably, he's been identified in other child abductions across the country, including Michaela Joy Garrett, who disappeared in November 88 from her home in Hayward, California. The night before Johnny's abduction, Bonacci saw a man bring photos of young boys to Emilio. He says one was Johnny Gotch. Noreen Gosh remembered that a neighbor noticed a woman taking pictures of Johnny exactly three months before his abduction. Even more interesting, when the neighbor saw the picture being taken matches exactly the background described by Bonacci in the photo he saw. And you know what's curious, if Bonacci's interview here, if he's describing this photo from prison and he had never been to the Gosh home and didn't know what the neighbor's houses looked like, how would he be able to describe that? And again, check out all the previous episodes for especially the previous one episode three for definitive information on how on how they came to believe Bonacci because of these diaries that were age tested to have been written before he was in prison so before he had access to any before any of this information was public he had written it in his diary regarding Johnny Gosh and these other criminals Mike was a boy who Bonacci claims was with him in the backseat of the car that Emilio was driving on the day of the abduction. He said another man pushed Johnny into the car and Paul used chloroform to knock Johnny out. Bonacci said they were taken to a farmhouse in Sioux City, Iowa, where he was the first to sexually abuse Johnny and then photos were taken. Emilio entered the room and told Bonacci and Mike to undress Johnny. Emilio had a buyer who wanted to see the photos of the boys doing things to each other. Eventually the buyer arrived, looked at the pictures, paid $35,000 and took Johnny to Colorado. Charlie ran the farm in Sioux City, Bonacci says. Roy Stevens actually located a Chuck who he believes is Charlie and found people who said things about Chuck that were similar to what ben Bonacci said about Charlie. The Colonel was the man who Bonacci said ran a ranch in Colorado. Bonacci said the last time he saw Johnny was, in the, was back in 1986 at that same ranch. Johnny, whose hair was now dyed black and was renamed Mark, had attempted to run away. When they caught up with him, they branded Johnny on his right buttock like a piece of livestock. John DeCamp, legal counsel to the chairman of the state senate committee that investigated the federal credit union and who later became a state senator, wrote a book on the scandal called The Franklin Cover-Up. At first, he too was skeptical of Bonacci's claims, but now he believes that high-level government officials wanted to keep everything quiet and did everything they could to discredit Paul Bonacci. He wonders why the FBI completely refused to investigate Bonacci's claims regarding Johnny Gosh. It was a forbidden zone, they wouldn't even talk about it, says DeCamp. DeCamp says Bonacci's multiple personalities, at last count 28, is a result of years of sexual abuse and mind control. It's caused by the very things he describes. In 1990, investigator Gary Caradori, who was investigating Paul Bonacci's claims for the Nebraska state legislation, urgently phoned state Senator Lauren Schmidt from Chicago saying he had found the smoking gun. Caradori told Schmidt he would fly that night from Chicago in his private plane with his son back to Lincoln, Nebraska. The plane exploded over Aurora, Illinois, killing Caradori and his eight-year-old son. According to an eyewitness, just before hearing the explosion, he saw a flash of light. A sheriff's deputy recovers pictures of children with high-profile politicians. Caradori's briefcase containing photos in, on the rear seat of the plane disappear and are never recovered. Huh. October 91, Noreen Gosh met Paul Bonacci in a face-to-face -face meeting. She said Paul described to her things about Johnny that she had never released to the press, that Johnny Gosh had a stutter, and that he had taken yoga. And this is, again, as we went over in the previous episode, pretty much everything Noreen Gosh says has been verified at one point or another. So just looking at the time, even things that weren't verified previously, like as time goes by, she seems to be vindicated at every turn. And again, because can anybody turn up any initial articles talking about Johnny Gosh's stutter and his yoga? 
Because, I mean, yoga is not that popular back then. I mean, even now, it's not really popular with 12-year-old boys. But back then, it wasn't really that popular with anybody. So, yeah, I mean, th this is crazy stuff here. Because of these small details, she believes Paul Bonacci's story is true. In a bizarre coincidence, that summer, a friend of the gosh... See, th this is truly a coincidence. I went over this in the previous episode. This might have actually been a neighbor, and I would like to know if this was the same neighbor that saw that woman photographing... Gosh, in a bizarre coincidence, that summer, a friend of the Gosh's was in a Denver restaurant and hap and noticed painted on the bathroom wall in a bright red nail polish, Johnny Gosh was here. Roy Stevens showed a series of photos, including the Mexican restaurant, to Bonacci. Without prompting, Bonacci identified the restaurant and recalled how he, Johnny, and Mike went into the bathroom and Johnny painted Johnny Gosh was here on the wall. Bonacci even produced a letter from his friend Mike mentioning how Johnny Gosh wrote on the bathroom walls in a Mexican restaurant in red nail polish. In 1992, America's Most Wanted aired the Johnny Gosh story, and with the help of Paul Bonacci, several composite sketches were drawn of the principals involved in the alleged pedophilia ring. The FBI attempts to get the network to kill the story. Why would the FBI not want the show to air? After the show aired, Noreen Gosh received a 14-page letter from a boy named Jimmy, who said the same men who abducted her son had abducted him, and he told her that Johnny was still alive. Noreen said he knew personal details about her son that she had never before released, and she believes him. America's Most Wanted aired a series of interviews with Jimmy in March 93, in which Jimmy talked about his friendship with Johnny. He said they had made a blood oath to protect and help each other and to trust each other always. Jimmy said he was with Johnny at the ranch in Colorado for four years, and that when Jimmy overheard talking about escaping, he too was branded. Jimmy lifted his pant leg and revealed a large brand on his leg similar to the brand Paul Bonacci had seen on Johnny. Jimmy later met with Noreen and John Gosh Sr. and gave them a diary he had kept of his life. Included in it were some of Johnny's memories of the time when he was a paper boy. Jimmy wrote that Johnny had 37 customers and how proud he felt when he won the local paper boy competition and won a free airline ticket. Noreen says all of that is true. America's Most Wanted Producers took Bonacci to Colorado in an attempt to find the Colonel's Ranch where these boys say they were held. Outside of Buena Vista, but Paul Bonacci recognized a piece of property. He physically reacted when he walks up to the front door and began to cry uncontrollably. Paul showed America's Most Wanted the secret underground chamber where he says the children were put in case authorities came by. Paul says some of the boys were placed there blindfolded as a form of punishment. In 97, Noreen Gosh says Johnny himself paid her a visit. A visit. He stayed for an hour and told her what happened to, her, to him and why he could never come home or see her again because of the criminal activity he's now involved in. That sparked a book penned by Noreen called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. But the latest twist is the most bizarre. On August 27, 2006, two photos were left at the home of Noreen Gosh. In one photo, a young boy is tied up and gagged, and a brand mark is seen on his upper arm, which surprisingly appears identical to the brand mark on Jimmy's ankle that America's Most Wanted videotaped in 1993. It's curious, too, that this America's Most Wanted episode apparently is, is not available anywhere. I mean, someone must have taped it even off the TV. Like, this is kind of weird. And we didn't go over this detail before, so... I mean, this is, this is crazy. It is also identical to the one Paul Bonacci described to America's Most Wanted in 1992 that he claimed to have seen on Johnny Gosh's rear end in the late 80s. So the, the, the timeline of, this, of branding, this branding, this type of branding, is Bonacci first, then in 93, Jimmy presents it. And, and in 2006... Two photos show up to Noreen Gosh, and it's the same exact brand mark. That's weird. The other photo shows three boys lying side by side in a bed, also bound and gagged. Noreen Gosh was certain her son Johnny is in two of the photos and quickly turned them over to the police for analysis. But just this week, the West Des Moines police say Johnny Gosh is not among the boys in the photos. 
Nelson Zava, a retired detective from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office in Tampa, recognized the photos as evidence in a case he investigated in 78 or 79, which predate Johnny Gosh's 82 disappearance. Retired Detective Zava says all the boys in the photos were identified, but failed to provide authorities with enough evidence to prosecute the man who took the pictures. Hillsborough Sheriff's Department is now researching their files to locate the original photos because retired Detective Zava does not recall seeing a brand mark on the boy in the photo. And just an update here, this is I went over in the previous episode, that photo was taken in 82 because there there's there's, uh, there's things in the background that were only available after 82. So that photo could not have been taken in 78 or 79. And supposedly Zalva admits this and his own mistake. According to Noreen Gosh, he apologized for this. So here's an update here. Photo of George H.W. Bush surfaces with what appears to be a young Johnny Gosh standing behind Bush. I chose to post Johnny's story first because it's been established it was an Illuminati Abduction. Now, this is on clandestine rage revealed WordPress. So they're claiming that it's been established that it's an Illuminati, not just an abduction by a pedophile ring, but an Illuminati abduction. Given what you've learned thus far in this blog, what characteristics common to Illuminati abductions appear in the Gosh abduction? Johnny can fit either of the two abdu types of abductees given the uncertainty of the clothes he was wearing at the time. A possible white t-shirt and blue jeans would fit type 1, but given the fact that Johnny had a slight disability, a stutter, he could also fit the type 2 abductee. We know from an eyewitness account, a neighbor saw a strange woman photographing Johnny three months prior to his actual abduction, which means Johnny had been under surveillance prior to the abduction. What the article doesn't mention is the fact that Johnny's dad normally accompanied Johnny on his paper route, but couldn't that day, also supports Johnny having been under surveillance. They kn knew which morning to snatch him as his dad wasn't with him. What a woman, what woman was seen photographing Johnny also supports the male-female abduction team. Okay, also some people believe, of course, Leonard got John, Leonard... Gosh, Johnny's father is responsible as well. Local police stalled the initial investigation by insisting Johnny was a runaway despite his mother's claim he was not, that he must have been abducted, which is what forced Johnny's law to be passed, forcing police to act immediately in child disappearances, which of course they didn't because there was the there was also the Mark Allen case, the third boy from the area abducted. I also question the police claiming to be understaffed on Labor Day weekend. While this may have been true, police generally schedule more officers to work holiday weekends. While when Noreen Gosh tells local law enforcement she's received a tip, another paper boy will be abducted, police call her crazy and ignore the tip. This is the typical Illuminati tactic of portraying credible witnesses as mentally ill in order to discredit them. And the fact police refuse to act on her tip speaks for itself. The abduction vehicle was a blue sedan. Johnny was drugged with chloroform, one or a, one of two drugs favored by the Illuminati. I mean, yeah, but criminals also use that all the time. The FBI quickly stepped into both the Gosh and Martin disappearances in order to control the investigation and media coverage. This is evidenced by the FBI attempting to prevent America's Most Wanted from airing their episode on Johnny's abduction. We have Illuminati repetition as well. Both Gosh and Martin were paperboys. You have the suspicious death of investigator Gary Caridori, who was preparing to expose the government pedophile ring, so was murdered when his plan exploded. This, again, speaks to Illuminati reputation of tactics, as the exact same method was used by our government. Typically, George H.W. Bush and his spawn offspring, W, to bring down JFK Jr.'s plane and kill him. The Illuminati appear to have a penchant for blowing up planes. Again, I am not claiming any of this is true or untrue. This is the clandestine rage revealed WordPress blog here. Symbolism appears via the branding of the boys with the Rocking X brand. Numerology, Johnny was born in the 11th month, was under surveillance for three months, and was just shy of his 13th birthday, as is often the case in male abductions for this pedophile ring. The boys are often just shy of their 13th birthday or are 13 years old when abducted. Satanic Holidays. While Johnny was abducted just two days before the marriage of the Beast Satanic Holiday, his, up his upcoming birthday may have been more of a mitigating factor, as the most important holiday to Satanists is one's own birthday. We have evidence tampering in the Caridori plane crash by apparently both law enforcement and the government. The photos recovered by the sheriff's deputy and the backseat of the plane both mysteriously disappear. 
What's, so the entire backseat disappeared. What's really interesting about this, so they were there in the, during the crash and then disappeared, never recovered. What's really interesting about this case is that all questioning of witnesses and discovery of evidence that Johnny was abducted into this pedophile ring was not done by law enforcement or the FBI, but by the private investigators Noreen Gosh hired to investigate Johnny's abduction. Johnny Gosh is now 39 years old, and to date no one has been charged or prosecuted in his abduction, despite the overwhelming evidence that was discovered pointing to an Illuminati abduction. Thinker Bell posted a response to this article here, January 27, 2013. Very interesting response here. There's nothing clandestine about them. These people stalk and terrorize for profit. Some claim they are trying to solve crime. Most are committing crimes. They pop up and reveal themselves in the groups they represent easily enough. Most get out of the military or police force or simply want to be private detectives and perpetuate the stalking. They hawk their unfounded wares to the ears of liars who believe their lies. They curl up in conspiracy blogs and rage on. They snuggle up to police who protect their atrocities. They sell their wares to religious outlets and media moguls as well. Gosh's case is representative of what they really do. They pinned all their robberies on one bank. The fact is they filter through many of the purpose of running the same scam. They pull this crap in my state too. It wasn't until I was in another state that I realized that they were not only stalking me, but had been working over my brother, who once lived near a military base in another state. He thinks anyone that has been in the military does so for the betterment of the country. Most are there for the betterment of themselves. We saw a woman sitting at the end of the block. She'd sit there for a long time with no obvious reason, as most were rather elderly, so it isn't reasonable they were surveying a drug house. I figured she was the wife of a Marine that had befriended him earlier. The conspiracy theorists have set up shop in the area. It was noticeable a few years ago when I noticed I couldn't get a car repaired anywhere they were. What? What they do is stalk people, break in, and try to convince people they have some type of mental dysfunction. For elderly, it would be a dementia-type syndrome. Some have dementia, but what they do is consistent with what they are doing to even younger people. They, what they want is their meds and access to their financial records. When they start the genetic connecting, it's only a reason to track down family members and threaten their target with the harm they'll do to those people if they don't do their bidding. They'll haul in illegals and drugs and find people to hide behind in the process. The media hides them well with their experts. In my state, they chase storms and catastrophes. They haul these illegal with them. They target people to hide behind for their credit card scams and identity theft operations. Recently, I had a man make a plate for my mailbox to keep these mind-reading superheroes out. I told him what was going on. He asked if I'd ever seen them, as he, too, believes in the power of the military to create the same effects. Yes, many times. These people aren't masterminds. It's just they've conducted studies that endorse that ensures they employ the worst and most insecure people imaginable. I recall a woman who administered these tests once said when they took it, it was suggestive she'd go into, the, into plumbing. He lives in fear, much like cancer patients, because people want the painkillers. This is why the woman was sitting at the end of the block, no doubt. Nothing a decent switch played couldn't take care of. What the heck comment is that? Okay. Well, anyway, let's, uh, let's continue on here. So, Illuminati mind control abduction or not, what is going on with Jeff Gannon? So, let's go through the wiki breakdown on Jeff Gannon. James Dale Guckert, born May 22nd, 1957, allegedly, is an American conservative columnist better known by the pseudonym Jeff Gannon. Between 2003 and 2005, he was given credentials as a White House reporter. He was eventually employed by the conservative website Talon News during the later part of this period. Gannon first gained national attention during a presidential press conference on January 26, 2005, when he asked United States President George W. Bush a question that some in the press corps considered so friendly it might have been planted. The question was, how are you going to work with Senate Democratic leaders who seem to have divorced themselves from reality, end quote. <laughs> divorced themselves from reality. I mean, is that kind of like an inside joke? I mean, I'm going to go over the theory that Jeff Gannon, the mind control and the multiple personality disorders are so crazy that if he really is Johnny Gosh, he doesn't think he is. And he doesn't believe he is, even if he is. But of course, the subconscious knows. 
Gannon routinely obtained daily passes to White House briefings, attended four Bush press conferences, and appearing regularly at White House press briefings. Although he did not qualify for a congressional press pass, Gannon was given daily passes to White House briefings after supplying his real name, date of birth, and social security number. Gannon came under public scrutiny for his lack of a journalistic background prior to his work with Talon and his involvement with various gay escort service websites using the professional name Bulldog. Gannon resigned from Talon News. And it is the Talon News, like, so this, well, this was some kind of fake company, but what, what does Talon mean? That he's within the Talons of this uh, conspiracy and these uh, group of traffickers? Gannon resigned from Talon News February 8, 2005. Continuing to use the name Gannon, he has since created his own official homepage and worked for a time as a columnist for the Washington Blade newspaper, where he confirmed he was gay after he was outed. Most recently, Gannon operated JeffGannon.com, a blog where he criticized those who exposed him, the old media, and the angry gay left, accusing them of promoting a double standard. The site has since been taken offline and the domain expired. He published a book titled The Great Media War in 2007. Media career, White House press credentials. Gannon first attended White House press conference February 28, 2003, and there asked a question of then White House press Se secretary Ari Flesher. At the time, Gannon had never had an article published and was not associated with any kind of news organization. Talon News had not yet been created. However, Gannon states that he was editor of his high school student newspaper as proof of having some journalistic experience. And was that ever verified? That's just his claim. White House Press Secretary Scott McClellan later stated that there had been no breakdown in security and no one had interfered intervened on Gannon's behalf to ensure his access, despite the fact that he had been able to get a press pass for the White House using an assumed name. Gannon's response was that the alias Jeff Gannon was a professional name used for convenience, claiming that his real last name is hard to spell and pronounce. Guckert? That's not that hard. And that the Secret Service was aware of his identity. Journalists have said that it can take weeks to get the kind of clearance Gannon received. He was issued one-day press passes for nearly two years, avoiding the extensive background checks for permanent passes. And sidestepping his inability to gain the necessary congressional press pass. He applied for a congressional press pass in April 2004, but was denied one by the Standing Committee of Correspondence, a group of congressional reporters who oversee press credential distribution on Capitol Hill, on the grounds that Talon did not qualify as a legitimate independent news service. So it was just a shell company or something? On his resume, Gannon said he's a graduate of the Leadership Institute Broadcast School of Journalism, a two-day seminar for conservatives who want a career in journalism. And has that ever been re re has that ever been verified? Again, these are just claims by Gannon. Who has verified these claims? Talon News was a virtual organization with no physical office or newsroom owned by the website Go GOP USA. Robert Eberl is the president and CEO of both GOP USA and Talon News. This has led to unproven charges that Talon News was created specifically to give Gannon a news organization that he could ostensibly represent to justify his continuing to work at the White House. By the middle of February 2005, the Talon News website had shut down indefinitely, according to the message on the site. And since May 2007, the Talon News site has been a parody, and its pages link to the Firesign Theaters website. What? What the heck? So the Fire Sign Theater, an American surreal comedy troupe. Okay, so is this is this whole case some kind of psyop? Because the coincidence stack is insane. The names are insane. I mean, everything you look at, it just doesn't make any sense. Controversy. The controversy over Gannon's background started after President George W. Bush's January 26, 2005 press conference, at which Gannon asked the president the following question. Senate Democratic leaders have painted a very bleak picture of the U.S. economy. Harry Reid was talking about soup lines, and Senator Hillary Clinton was talking about the economy being on the verge of collapse. Yet, in the same breath, they say that Social Security is rock solid and there's no crisis here. How are you going to work? You've said you're going to reach out to these people. How are you going to work with people who seem to have divorced themselves from reality? 
Gannon's question was ridiculed on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart inquiring, who is this muckraking Jeff Gannon who is holding the president's feet to the fire so that he can more easily give him a reach around? The question was also derided by a number of bloggers who considered it an excessively deferential question for a reporter to ask at a presidential press conference. The question also contained a factually inaccurate assertion. The supposed comments about soup lines had not been made by Reid, but had been satirically attributed to him by conservative commentator Rush Limbaugh. So Gannon couldn't even get his facts straight. After the January 26, 2005 press conference, scrutiny into his personal and professional background by news organizations and blogs began. On February 8, 2005, Gannon resigned from Talon News and shut down his website, jeffgannon.com, according to Howard Kurtz of the Washington Post, who stated this, Jeff Gannon, whose naked pictures have appeared in a number of gay escort sites, says that he has regrets about his past, but that White House officials knew nothing about his salacious activities. Gannon said that he has been stalked and that his family has been harassed. Any evidence of that? He has revived his website since that time. Gannon is alleged to have registered several internet domain names, including hotmilitarystud.com and militaryescorts4m.com, and posted naked pictures of himself. According to The Independent, bloggers revealed that Jeff Gannon had previously worked as a $200 an hour gay prostitute who advertised himself on a series of websites with names such as hotmilitarystud.com. So again, if he was a kidnapped child who was forced into some prostitution life, does that match up with this, with this Gannon individual? When those ads became public, Gannon refused to specifically address them, but admitted that he had made mistakes in his past. During the 04 election, he wrote that John Kerry might someday be known as the first gay president and that Kerry had supported the pro-gay agenda. Cliff Kincaid, editor of the conservative organization Accuracy in Media, wrote that the campaign against Gannon demonstrates the paranoid mentality and mean-spirited nature of the political left. In April 06, Gannon appeared on the television program Lie Detector, produced by Mark Phillips Films and Television for the PAX Network, now Ion Television, submitting to and passing a polygraph test while asserting that he was not a White House operative. Okay, so was that polygraph fixed? And if not, they should have asked him the Johnny Gosh questions. Connections to blame investigation. Gannon was questioned by the Justice Department in relation to the department's criminal investigation into the Valerie Plame affair, in which Plame's identif identity as an employee of the CIA was leaked to a journalist by an administration official. On October 28, 2003, Talon News published an interview in three parts that Gannon had conducted with Ambassador Joseph C. Wilson, Plame's husband whom the CIA had sent to Niger in 2003 to investigate claims that Iraq was attempting to procure yellow cake uranium. In the interview, Gannon asked Wilson about an internal government memo prepared by U.S. intelligence personnel that said Plame had suggested Wilson for the job. In a February 2005 interview, Gannon told CNN's Wolf Blitzer that the FBI had spoken to him in an effort to learn who had leaked the, invest the classified memo and to whom, but that he had not been asked be to appear before the grand jury investigating the case. Many assumed that the White House had leaked this memo to him. Gannon said he learned about its existence after it had been mentioned in a story published in the Wall Street Journal. Previously, Gannon has been criticized by Tom Daschle's supporters when he covered the South Dakota Senate race between Daschle and John Thune. Supporters of Daschle claimed he acted as a de facto member of the Thune campaign while ostensibly a journalist. Washington Blade. In July 2005, Gannon began writing for the D.C. area gay publication Washington Blade. His articles in included criticisms of gay blogger John Aravosis, who had accused him of having pornographic ads. Blade editor Chris Crane attracted his own criticism from many in the gay community for this decision due to Gannon's criticism of the gay rights movement, as well as his refusal to disclose his sexual orientation. He has said, my personal life is a private matter, despite the fact that I have become a public person. Crane defended his decision in September 2005 editorial, writing that the steady stream of feedback and vitriol has declined a, li a little with each new Gannon article. Crane resigned as editor in 06, retaining ownership in the paper's parent company. The new editorial team fired Gannon as a result of what editor Kevin Naff called Gannon's huge credibility problem. 
The House Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary Committee voted against House Resolution 136 on March 16, 2005 that would have directed the Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security to transmit documents in the possession of officials to the House of Representatives. These documents related to the security investigations and background checks involved in granting Gannon access to the White House. The documents were to be transmitted no later than 14 days after the date of adoption of the resolution. During the committee meeting, Democratic Representative Sheila Jackson Lee claimed that Gannon had engaged in a penetration of the White House, maybe a security breach, and I do not believe it can be answered with self-investigation. Wow. Chairman Jim Sessenbrenner said that the letter from the Secret Service dated March 7, 2005 stated, Please be advised that our Office of Protective Operations has looked into this matter and has determined that there was no deviation from Secret Service standards and procedures as your letter suggests. Gannon later wrote in his blog, quote, I hope this vote will put these issues to rest and allow me to return to my work as a journalist, end quote. In his self-published book, The Great Media War, he responds to questions about whether he played some role for the Bush White House other than that of an independent journalist. White House records, Democratic representatives John Conyers of Michigan and Louis Slaughter of New York had submitted similar requests under FOIA on February 15, 2005. The Department of Homeland Security answered Slaughter's request with Secret Service records of Gannon's check-in and out times at the White House. In a 2005 interview, he stated that he has never spent the night at the White House. Okay, and if he had, what would he state? Okay, so... There's just, uh, there's just, I mean, in this case, obviously, one big mess here, and so many unanswered questions. So, let's go to Web Sleuths for some posts here from 2019. According to people claiming to be involved in the pedophile ring, Johnny was kept alive because he was so much in the media limelight. He was the golden boy or the media boy, then he ran away and escaped. Neither Eugene Martin nor Mark James Allen had the same publicity as Johnny. So if Johnny is alive, and if the others were abducted into the same organization and are dead, then one could justify it that way. I mean, that's an interesting point that nobody thinks about. So all these sickos, would they want to pay more for this missing boy who had all this national attention? So would this pedophile ring make a lot more money by keeping him alive? The only reason I can think of that would keep a grown man from resurfacing and reconnecting with his family are, one, the family had something to do with the abduction, John Leonard Gosh, question mark, or two, the now grown man had done some pretty bad things that are against the law and stepping forward might cause him to have to answer to those bad things. What else could keep a 40-something man from stepping forward and saying, hey, I'm John Gosh and this is what happened when I was 12? Some responses here, never underestimate the power of fear. And that's a good point as well. Some re posts here regarding uh, Gannon. I suppose technically, barring a DNA test, Gannon is up in the air. But I really don't think he is Johnny. Isn't there proof that Gannon was alive and well, last name Guckert, before Johnny was even abducted, school record and whatnot? And again, if there were a few photos produced or like one article, I mean, if this is a vast government conspiracy, yeah, that's the weird thing about coincidence theorists. I mean, if there is a, cons a vast, far-reaching government conspiracy involving, like, possibly billions of dollars, or if not, at least millions, how would they not be able to produce a couple of fake records? But coincidence there is they see those records and say, oh, well, that's that! That settles that! Because records can't be faked! It's just really weird, the Dunning-Kruger stylings of coincidence theorists. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's what happened. I'm just saying if there is a vast conspiracy and there was an attempt to cover it up, I mean, it clearly wouldn't be that diff difficult to fabricate some records and possibly pay off a couple people at schools or whatever. Another post here, we also have to remember that Johnny would be a very damaged human being and may not be ready to face the outside world. And again, or if this MK Ultra is so advanced, again, even if he's not Ganon, if he's somebody else, if he doesn't even know he's Johnny Gosh, he would never be able to come forward. Another response here, I don't think Ganon is Johnny Gosh either, but his background is very strange. I cannot let this one go as being possible. I am normally really dismissive of conspiracy theories. Everything about the idea Gannon is gosh seems ridiculous on the surface. But I don't think Gannon has ever produced anything to indicate evidence of a life before he was Guckert. 
I believe he indicated at one point that he would introduce parents or family members to the media, but that never happened. He also said he would take a DNA test, and never did. Look, if he is Johnny Gosh and had his reasons for not wanting to come forward, I don't think anyone should pressure him to. But this theory that seems so crazy, yet given the details of the case as plausible, is out there. And I can conceive of reasons he might not want to take a DNA test or bring family members into this, but no one in the media ever found a family member. And if you wanted to test someone's DNA, it's not illegal to use their trash or any discarded refuse of theirs to do so. I can't believe Noreen Gosh wouldn't have tried this already. Uh, unless she did. Unless she has nothing with Johnny's DNA on it to compare it to, in which, I mean, I'm sure they have his DNA. I can't believe Noreen wouldn't have tried this already. Okay, in which case, they, why haven't they given it to the police, given it a try? DNA obtained in the April Tinsley case was obtained without a warrant simply by intercepting the two remaining suspects trashed. I know it's a crazy theory, but everything about this case is crazy. Part of me wants to know what happened to Johnny Gosh, really wants someone to do a DNA test. That part of me doesn't want to see someone thrust into the spotlight unwillingly if they are Gosh. Knows it should be left alone. For me, it will always be something that hangs over this case, and I think it's possibly true. Yeah, I mean, th this is crazy. So let's continue down this rabbit hole, and we will be touching upon Hunter S. Thompson. This is a post from imaginativeworlds.com, Enter the Realm of Unknown forums, and uh, I don't believe this is up anymore, but back in 2005, an interesting post here, March 28, 2005, by Gormworm. Friday, 2000, uh, February 25, 2005, Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh... Hunter Thompson, and Bohemian Grove Snuff Porn. I've been watching this story percolate since this weekend, and with Thursday's return of Jeff Gannon to the blogosphere with a column entitled Fear and Loathing in the Press Room, really brings it all full circle. Several questions are begged here. As the Jeff Gannon story progressed and turned into a Bush White House homosexual prostitution scandal, internet investigators started asking if there could be a connection to the previous Bush White House homosexual prostitution scandal. If you recall, the stories of 15-year-old callboys wandering through the White House in the middle of the night was linked to the Franklin cover-up case exposed by Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp. In that case, a Republican operative named Larry King was involved with procuring boys and girls from Boys Town in Nebraska and elsewhere and entrapping them in a child sex slave and espionage ring. King, with an annual salary of under $20,000, was throwing sex parties for the powerful in a $5,000 a month condo in Washington, D.C., apparently taping the proceedings for blackmail purposes. And again, in 2005, to coincidence theorists and a 30 worshipping cultists, they probably were like, oh, this is complete nonsense. But in the post-Epstein area, a lot of these coincidence theorist goofs, I mean, even they, are they still pretending and hallucinating that there's no no corruption of this kind. I mean, it's just weird. One of the victims of this ring was one Paul Bonacci, who testified in court proceedings that he helped kidnap Johnny Gosh in the, into the ring in 1982. It was apparently 2.29 a.m. Sunday, February 20th, when the question was first asked, is Jeff Gannon really Johnny Gosh? By the end of the day, Hunter S. Thompson was reported dead. Must have been another coincidence, though. I mean, how could it not be a coincidence, right? So let's go to total411.info. I don't think this is up anymore either, but February 2005. Total information analysis. Friday, February 25th, 2005. Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, Hunter Thompson, and Bohemian uh, Grove Snuff Porn. And this is where it gets really interesting. Bonacci also testified that he was forced in July 1984 to participate in a homosexual, pedophilic, necrophilic orgy at what has since been identified as Bohemian Grove, all of which was filmed. And according to Bonacci, the man in charge of the filming was someone picked up in Las Vegas on the plane headed to the Grove, a man who Bonacci was told was one Hunter Thompson. 
No doubt most people who came across this information in the past were familiar with Thompson's work, dismissed the idea that the man behind the camera could have been the famous writer. After all, this was a man who had been fighting the likes of Nixon and Bush his entire career. But could Thompson have been brought to the grove by someone who presented it as an opportunity to investigate what the power elite was up to behind closed doors? Could Thompson have quickly found himself in over his head, compromised by virtue of his very presence at this horrific crime, by the men he thought he was investigating undercover? Wow, what a theory that is. Or perhaps compromised some other way. Perhaps, for instance, he was surreptitiously filmed with an adult female prostitute who was then murdered, but I digress. But back for now to the who is Jeff Gannon question. James D. Guckert seems to have appeared out of nowhere around 1999 setting up male escort websites. In profiles on these sites from around 2001, Jeff said he was 31 years old, closer to Johnny Gosh's age than James Guckert's. Huh. Guckert Gannon claims to be 47 today in 2005 at the time of this article. So he changed his age. Okay, well that's weird. Jeff Gannon, aka James Guckert, also was attending alumni events at the TKE fraternity of Westchester College in Pennsylvania. Local media called the college and confirmed that a James Guckert graduated from Westchester in 1980. But apparently no one has checked yearbooks and such to confirm if the same man seems to be depicted. Okay, and Guckert, I would argue Guckert is a more popular name than Gannon, because I've known a couple Guckerts uh, in passing. I've seen that name quite more often than, than, uh, than Gannon. Could James Guckert be just another false identity? Another Democratic underground investigator found 1986 and 1987 pictures of a Jeff Guckert not a James Guckert, but a Jeff Guckert from Fairview High School in that same Pennsylvania-Delaware border area that James D. Guckert, a.k.a. Jeff Gannon, claimed residence on his escort and porn website and was cited for $20,000 in back taxes. Jeff Guckert would have been about the same age as Johnny Gosh when he was playing high school golf. Huh. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Did Gosh go on to assume the identity of James Guckert, a man 10 years older than himself, sometime in the 90s? Huh. Consider this. From his mother, Noreen Gosh, uh, Johnny Gosh Foundation website in 2001, Johnny was subjected to severe trauma and torture of a satanic and sexual nature in order to intentionally destroy the conscious personality brainwashing. This intentional application of trauma is a systematic procedure used to control these victims in order to use them in sexual slavery, pornography, and more. In February 1999, a federal court testimony in Omaha, Nebraska, Noreen Gosh testified that Johnny Gosh came to see her in 1997, providing information about his experience, asking for his mother's help, and pleading for her to not reveal his visit. Johnny is now 31 years old. After years of suffering tremendous torture and pain at the hands of his captors being used and abused, he and several others have escaped. They have been hiding. They have been living and hiding under new identities. They fear for their lives. People ask, why is it necessary for someone to hide and live this way? It is simple. Johnny can identify many of the people involved and would be a threat to the very people who took him. He is known as the chameleon. Why? Because he can so completely change his appearance. Chameleon, again, on Democratic Underground, someone points to a purple blemish on Jeff's chest in one of his circa 2002 escort photos, asking if that is a mark left by birthmark removal. According to his mother, Johnny the Chameleon Gosh still had the birthmark in 1997. So he just happens to have a blemish in the exact same spot where Johnny Gosh has a birthmark. Does anybody find that strange? Well, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. In one of his first interviews on CNN's Anderson Cooper 360, Jeff 
Gannon said James Guckert is the name on my driver's license. His handlers have apparently warned him on that point, and he now claims it is given name. So what is the deal here? Is Jeff Gannon really Johnny Gosh? Noreen Gosh refuses to confirm or deny. If Gannon is Gosh, what is going on with him? Is his strange behavior a result of years of brainwashing, or is it something more? Is it possible he drew attention to himself during that January 26th press conference to pique the curiosity of citizen investigators, to draw attention to the dark side of the past 24 years of the Bush regime? He invited this investigation after the press conference and before the escort revelations by publishing a column titled, Hiding in Plain Sight. What? And this was within days of the Franklin cover-up figure George Paul Bishop's sudden arrest. So he wrote, so the first major article he wrote was hiding in plain sight. What? Okay. And did that investigation have anything to do with the death of Hunter Thompson? Sherman Skolnick and Tom Hennigan at Cloak and Dagger Internet Radio say... Thompson was working on a book about high-level sex rings, though they haven't offered a source. But that claim aside, we still have the timing of Thompson's reported death coinciding with these investigations. Did Thompson kill himself out of shame for his part at what happened at the Grove? Was he murdered to shut him up? Or did he fake his death to go underground while all this was breaking? Is there anything to all these questions? Jeff Gannon hints at a yes by putting up a new website, Headlined by a piece titled After Thompson's Most Famous Works, It's All in Plain Sight, I'll Bet Through the Looking Glass. Huh. Comments here are that uh, the birthmark, that blemish that is could be birthmark removal, it could also just be, uh, it could also be some kind of makeup. All right, let's let's go down this rabbit hole. I mean, this is some dark stuff. This is really, really dark. We're going to go to unicorn144.wordpress.com. And this is November 30th, 2016. The Paperboy Johnny Gosh and the Hunter S. Thompson snuff film at Bohemian Grove. In 2010, the Huffington Post released an article on a problem that gets little attention in the mainstream press. And what's curious is that it has since, uh, I don't know if it's still available, it's not coming up, but I mean, I'm gonna read a transcription of the article, but I don't, I don't know if it's still online here. One that if you do your research into it, you will uncover a monster so vile, it will make you shudder. Some cry, some fill with rage, many just turn away as if the truth of the matter is so harsh that they just can't compute it when they see what's really going on with the highest levels of government and elite circles in America. So this is Huffington Post, July 23rd, 2010. A major federal investigation has found that dozens of military officials and defense contractors, including some with top-level security clearances, allegedly bought and downloaded child pornography on private or government computers. The Pentagon on Friday released investigative reports spanning almost a decade that implicated individuals working with agencies handling some of the nation's most closely guarded secrets, including the National Security Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office, which operates U.S. spy satellites. Defense workers who purchase child porn put the Department of Defense, the military, and national security at risk by compromising computer systems, military installations, and security clearances, a 2007 investigative report said. The suspects also put the Defense Department at risk of blackmail, bribery, and threats, one report added. The, report, the reports, however, do not point to any specific security breaches. Huh. So back to the blog here, this story, high-level government workers with millions of child porn files on their work computers came to the list, came to light originally through the Boston Globe in 2010, who had obtained documents through the Freedom of Information Act from the U.S. government, though most of the documents were blacked out, including, of course, most names. Some arrests were made at the time, and a few five-year prison terms were handed out. Some of them accused quickly paid fines, most were never named, and got away with it, although the Pentagon 
swore to investigate the disgusting epidemic further to get to the bottom of it. Skip ahead a couple years to 2012, and we find the Pentagon did nothing of the sort. There were no further findings reported. In fact, there was no action whatsoever, and according to Forbes that year, September 19th, 2012, the Pentagon is under fire for failing to examine 1,700 out of the 5,200 reports of employees doing child porn. The Pentagon claimed it wasn't a priority. Senator Grassley and his staff have made it one. The closed investigation into widespread use of child porn at the Pentagon is now reopened. And this, this article is still up on Forbes.com. Uh, September 19th, 2012, to catch government workers with ties to child porn, call the IRS. That's from that article. 5,200 reports. This could be the most disturbing thing ever reported. Can you picture any other organization having 5,200 known pedophiles all working on the same place? I mean, it's kind of unclear how many of the reports are from the same person, though. But this is no coincidence, that's for sure. These men and women who are government officials, national security agents, Pentagon workers, elected representatives, intelligence agents, etc., to be doing this at work or on government networks in general altogether shows that it is a company-wide epidemic which must stem from inside the company, the U.S. government. To this day, this case remains an unknown work in progress. Since this story has been forgotten by the mainstream media as of late, or at least suppressed, it basically doesn't exist anymore. But this sickening tale doesn't start in 2010 with the Boston Globe article. Way back in the late 1980s, there was a scandal blown open known as the Franklin cover-up in which a banker named Lawrence King, who ended up going to jail on a $40 million fraud charge for stealing, uh, for stealing from the credit union he rang, also was identified for running a child prostitution ring out of Nebraska where hundreds of children, some younger than 10, were flown around the country on chartered jets to have sex and much worse activities with extremely wealthy and powerful American men. High-ranking government officials, including those in the White House at the time who were fingered for not only pedophilia but making videos of their actions, beating the young men they raped, owning child prostitutes of their own, trading the kids between themselves, and even murdering them. Though there were 80 kids who came forward who were used as sex slaves for King, all telling the same story, after death threats and a few murders, 78 of the kids rescinded their stories. I mean, that's still a lot. 80 kids to come out of the woodwork if they were lying. I mean, that's a lot. The two that didn't were put in jail for perjury. No investigation has ever been launched into the matter since. The first film we're showing, though, it was bought out and canceled 20 minutes before it was set to air on TV, was made at the height of the scandal. It's enough to make your jaw drop to the floor. It will also shed light on why this is the Franklin cover-up and not the biggest case in American history. And if it wasn't covered up, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is just crazy. I mean, people, look at the outrage over, again, I mean, perhaps uh, Donald Trump's tweets or whatever. The country went crazy. A lot of people went crazy over comments he made or, or whatever jokes he made. I mean, when there's this going on, I mean, just imagine the disproportional outrage here on um, the harming of children versus, you know, tweet, you know, some jokes from a politician. I mean, it's just crazy. And they're referring, of course, to the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. Long before Alex Jones snuck a camera in to film the cremation of care ceremony, one of King's child victims in the above film, Paul Bonacci, testified that he made midnight visits to the White House in the 1980s and witnessed top politicians receive sexual acts from male children. Bonacci has also been documented many times recounting a bone-chilling story of himself and another boy being forced into making a snuff film, a film where someone is actually murdered in front of the camera, where a third child was raped, tortured, and killed in the notorious, now not-so-secret, elitist club in the redwoods of Northern California, called the Bohemian Grove. At the time of his emotional description, which is below, Bonacci, who was in prison for child abuse and perjury charges for not retracting his story like the other 78 victims, had no idea what the Bohemian Grove was. No one did until the internet came around, but he described 
exactly as it looks, where it was, where the snuff filming took place, and even states the men in hoods took care of the dead boy's body. It's uncanny. And uh, Bonacci's interviews are available on YouTube in various videos. I'm actually not going to listen to them because that's, uh, that's a bit too disturbing uh, for people that actually want to hear the words from his mouth. Again, just our background into Bonacci, everything he said regarding Gosh and a lot of these people was all verified by PIs, etc. Former Republican member of the Nebraska Liter Le Legislature, Senator John DeCamp, investigated the Franklin cover-up for decades, and in his book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska, he writes, quote, In other testimony, Paul Bonacci said that Larry King, not the CNN Larry King, Lawrence King of Franklin Credit Union, was smiling and laughing the whole time the film was being shown, and that the men in with hoods were a satanic group which planned to use the dead boy in some sort of ceremony. Bonacci also named the director of the snuff film who they had picked up in Las Vegas as Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson, so that's the end of the quote there. Hunter Thompson, question mark. Hunter S. Thompson of fear and loathing in Las Vegas fame. Yes, that's the allegation. And though, of course, it is only an accusation, here are some pretty damning supporting facts. A man named Russell Bridges, who was a, Rep a Republican Party photographer and also a photograph, a photographer for Lawrence King, claims Hunter S. Thompson offered him $100,000 to shoot a snuff film for him in the 80s, which he declined. Hunter S. Thompson's secretary wrote on his memoir blog that he once tried to make her watch a snuff film, which she refused to watch. Hunter S. Thompson's secretary, Nicole Brown, in in her memoirs, stated Hunter S. Thompson tried to get her to watch a snuff film connected to the Franklin cover-up. According to Wikipedia, Hunter S. Thompson lived in San Francisco, California, the same place as Bohemian Grove at the time this all allegedly took place, and he was researching twisted pornography at that time too, example bestiality and other disgusting mediums. This brings us to another link in this gruesome chain, Johnny Gosh. On September 5th, 1983, at 12 years old, while out on his paper route in West Des Moines, Johnny was kidnapped. His mother, Noreen Gosh, has been relentlessly searching for Johnny ever since and has come to some terrifying conclusions. The first, her son seems to have been targeted, photographed, and sold the night before his abductors grabbed him. Below, telling the rest is an excerpt by Noreen from johnnygosh.com. In 1989, Paul Bonacci provided his attorney, John DeCamp, with information indicating he had participated in the abduction of a Des Moines, Iowa paperboy. This paperboy was Johnny Gosh. Bonacci's testimony provided a great deal of info about Johnny in his case. However, local authorities refused to interview him, questioning his credibility. According to numerous reports, Johnny was taken by a highly organized, very corporate, global pedophile pornography ring. Evidence links to this... 80s congressional callboy scandal, money laundering, drug running, illegal arms deals, and more. Like so many others before and since, Johnny was subjected to severe trauma and torture of a satanic and sexual nature in order to intentionally destroy the conscious personality, brainwashing. This intentional application of trauma is a systematic procedure used to control these victims in order to use them in sexual slavery, pornography, and more. End quote. As mentioned in one of the movie clips below, an FBI agent in the 80s who was assigned to the case named Gary Caradori, once contacted Noreen saying he was flying out to Chicago to meet a source that would prove Johnny was a victim of the child sex slave ring. According to Caradori, he had photographic evidence that would blow the case out of the murky water. After meeting with his source, though, Caradori's private plane exploded in the air. He was with his 10-year-old son at the time. Both died in the crash. According to Noreen, Johnny contacted her in 97 when he was 27 and told her the whole story of how he was kidnapped, tortured, brainwashed, hooked on drugs, and sold into the child sex trade. He pleaded with her not to say anything, promising her it would be the last thing either one of them did. According to Johnny, there was no escaping. From johnnygosh.com, quote, The people who take these children also do a thorough job of brainwashing, telling these young children that if they try to resume any kind of life with their families, they will be killed. It is enough of a threat that they do not try to contact their families, end quote. Amazingly, a few years ago, it was thought that a man who went by the name of Jeff Gannon was Johnny Gosh. 
Gannon suddenly appeared, of all places, in the press corps of the White House during the Bush-Cheney administration. At first, nobody noticed him much. That is, until he started asking obvious softball questions meant for Bush to knock out of the park. Suspicious of the newcomer, the rest of the press corps did a little research on him. They quickly found that Jeff Gannon also went by the name James Guckert in the past and was also currently a high-paid male escort that went by the name of Bulldog. Retired agent Ted Gunderson, who intensely worked in the Johnny Gosh case until the day he died in 2011, was convinced that Gannon was Gosh. Gunderson says, my source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Go Johnny Gosh. Let's just say he's in a position to know the kids are all in touch with each other. It's a bond they all share. The only way I'd be 100% sure is if there was a DNA test or if he admitted it. So from Rents.com, August 18, 2008. Five, Noreen Gosh speaks about Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, and the attempted theft of her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, by Charlene Fassa. So, in this article here, they talk about Noreen being threatened by this guy trying to steal her remaining book inventory and the reprint rights to her book. This is unconscionable. Noreen's book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, represents a huge part of her life story, and frankly, it's practically all she tangibly has left of her son. And that brings us to the Jeff Gannon conundrum. In addition to the potentially devastating legal battle of her book, Noreen is still trying to determine if Jeff Gannon is indeed her son, Johnny Gosh. Those who say there's not enough credible evidence to demand a DNA test, which would finally resolve the issue, are simply wrong. For example, Jim Rothstein, a retired New York City detective who spent 35 years on the force, much of it investigating child slavery and pedophile rings, asserts that the evidence is strong that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh. To me, Gannon looks like Johnny, Rothstein opines. Everything just fits. The profile, the M.O., everything. Then there's Ted Gonderson. Uh, well, also, just another point there, if Gannon is not Gosh, he could be another boy who was kidnapped and sold into child slavery, etc., and then that led to his path into being a child escort and his Bush connections and all that. Then there's Ted Gunderson, a retired FBI agent who has worked on the Johnny Gosh case for over a decade. On Gunderson's website, his bio reads, prior to retirement in 1979, Ted Gunderson had over 700 persons under his command and operated a $22 million annual budget. His complete resume is at tedgunderson.com. Gunderson says he has a credible source that is certain Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. My source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Johnny Gosh. Gunderson reveals, let's just say he's in a position to know. The kids are all in touch with each other. It's a bond they all share. Gunderson concludes with, the only way I'd be 100% sure is if there is a DNA test or if he admitted it, end quote. Noreen confirms, quote, Ted sent me a videotape of his interview with his source. And the source said, Gannon is Gosh. And he said it. Without hesitation and without blinking an, an eye, and he said he's known it for months. Noreen believes the man is credible. Gunderson makes it clear that Bonacci is not his informant, but is quick to add that Bonacci informed him a while back that Gosh had changed his appearance. I mean, what does that mean, getting a, you know shaving his head or something? In fact, there's even corroboration from John DeCamp who weighs in with, quote, Bonacci told me the same thing, that Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. Wow. Okay, so th there's a lot of people say because because there's people saying that Bonacci says that he didn't say that or whatever, but if he did say it to DeCamp and then denied it to others, is that just a way to protect himself, even if he really did say it? Because a lot of coincidence there is they don't consider that possibility. But continuing on here... Uh, this bombshell from Noreen, the birthmark on Johnny's chest is very similar to a mark seen on Gannon's chest in at least one photo. Gannon has a spot on his right cheek in the same place as Johnny. So he has more than one mark on his body in the exact same spot. Rostin, Gunderson, and Noreen Gosh 
are from the article by Tim Schmidt, Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon, Honda Thompson, and the Unraveling of a Troubling Tale. Okay, I'm going to read this article as well. It's, yeah, there, there are some crazy, crazy little tidbits here. This is April 6, 2005 by Tim Schmidt. Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon, Hunter Thompson, and the Unraveling of a Troubling Tale. Cover story, Death of a Conspiracy. Noreen Gosh sits in a booth at the West Des Moines Village Inn, nursing a cup of coffee and managing, despite her larger-than-life personality, to blend into the surroundings and keep a low profile in the almost empty restaurant. She is open with her thoughts and willing to share what information she can, yet she remains guarded, cautious and thoughtful in a manner often mistaken as cold and standoffish. She thinks carefully as she speaks about her son Johnny and the players in a bizarre conspiracy surrounding his disappearance in 1982 that continues to evolve and may finally be on the verge of breaking down. Just because you don't want to believe something is true, says Noreen slowly, that doesn't mean it's not true. It's a statement that bears repeating. Just because you don't want to believe something is true, that doesn't mean it's not true. Anyone who has heard the theories surrounding Johnny Gosh's disappearance on September 5th, 1982, and who in Iowa has not, knows they are difficult to accept. If there are satanic pedophiles working in the top levels of government and law enforcement selling kids on the black market and forcing them into prostitution, pornography, extortion rings, and things far worse, it's easier as a human being to simply believe that such things could not be true. But they could be, and Noreen knows this all too well. She doesn't want to believe her child was kidnapped, sexually abused, tortured, brainwashed, and sold into slavery, but she accepts this now as an indisputable truth, and she is not alone. Many others accept the existence of a vast network of high-profile people, powerful politicians, business leaders, law enforcement, and government agents who exist in a subculture of degenerates who participate in child pornography, snuff films, drugs, devil worship, brainwashing, and kidnapping. And Noreen believes that Johnny and hundreds of other children like him were forced into this life of depravity by those who kidnapped him. But Johnny's story has been told thousands of times. It's been analyzed, disputed, and ridiculed just as frequently, and we neither have the time and space nor the inclination to repeat it in here in full. As tragic as it may be, it's old news. Nothing major has happened in the case for some time, and the alleged players in the story have been silent, absent, or simply missing for years. Until recently. In the past few months, there's been a flurry of activity among the people once related to this case and the conspiracy that surrounded it. In the midst of this commotion, some believe Johnny Gosh has been found very much alive. Recent events began with Jeff Gannon, the right-wing journalist who was found to have gained access to the White House press pool with few credentials and a fake name. The death of Hunter S. Thompson followed shortly after. The arrest of two men seemingly unrelated in Nebraska and Virginia within days of the Gannon story and Thompson's death also played a role in the story. And all these events, some suggest, are related to the 12-year-old paper boy kidnapped from West Des Moines 23 years ago. And if they are right, there is much more to come. Johnny lives. In late January, a conservative journalist in Washington, D.C. was found to have gained access to the White House press pool despite using a fake name and despite the fact that he once worked as a high-priced homosexual escort. Jeff Gannon was a White House correspondent for Talent News who regularly attended White House press briefings and had at least four press conferences with President George W. Bush. On January 26, 2005, Gannon asked a question of the president that was so friendly and factually inaccurate that some of his colleagues began looking into his background. And, and just a quick aside here again, and that's a very astute observation in the previous blog that we read that did Gannon do that on purpose to draw attention to himself so people would figure out he was Johnny Gosh while denying it in order not to put himself or Noreen Gosh in danger while at the, while simultaneously exposing it to the world, hiding in plain sight, as his article was titled, previous to him asking that question. Talon News, it was learned, is a barely disguised tool of the Republican Party, and Gannon's credentials as a journalist consist solely of a training course at a leadership broadcast school of journalism. After two days of training that cost $50, <laughs> Gannon was officially a graduate of a journalism school and on his way to the White House press pool. I mean, that is kind of laughable. It was soon discovered that Gannon's real name is Jeff Guckert and that he has also gone by the nickname Bulldog when listing himself on the internet as a homosexual escort and personal trainer, charging $200 per hour for his discreet services. Gannon was removed from the White House and resigned from Talon News on February 8th. 
Ganon Gate quickly became the presidential scandal of the hour, though the story faded from public view as politicians and the media eagerly turned their attention to such pressing matters as steroids in baseball and the Terry Schiavo situation. But before long, internet bloggers had picked up the story and began to think back to the administration of President Bush's father which was rocked by a scandal that allegedly involved a high-level official giving private late-night tours of the White House to teenage male prostitutes. The New York Times and the Washington Post both wrote about the story and the eventual death of Washington lobbyist Craig Spence, who reportedly arranged the visits. Spence, it has been suggested, was preparing to admit publicly that he was using the teenage boys to blackmail high-powered politicians in the Beltway. He committed suicide before he had the opportunity to do so. Shades of Jeffrey Epstein, anybody? Anybody? Jill Zane Maxwell, anybody? Anybody? With a gay escort gaining access to the White House during a Bush administration while many of the same officials from the 80s are back in power, the question became, is there a connection? Private investigator Sherman H. Skolnick posted a story about the Gannon debacle on Rents.com, a site known for its conspiracy theories, and publicly stated on February 19th that Gannon is Johnny Gosh. Andy Stevenson, a blogger from Seattle familiar with the case of the, uh, the details of the Johnny Gosh case and the child sex rings in Nebraska, detailed in the book The Franklin Cover-Up, began with a group of other writers and investigators to ponder the claim. They looked at markings on Gannon's body and compared them to those reported on Johnny Gosh. They considered the lack of personal information about Gannon's early years. They considered that Johnny was alleged to have been used as a gay prostitute for blackmail purposes. They considered that the high-powered people alleged to have kidnapped and brainwashed children as part of the government's Monarch Project and the MK Ultra program included Johnny, did so to use them in a variety of ways to advance their own agendas. And they contacted Noreen Gosh and discussed the idea with her, the first she'd heard of the theory, and they too came to the conclusion that Jeff Gannon is none other than Johnny Gosh. The internet has been abuzz with the theory ever since, and in a way, it makes perfect sense. You've got a kid abducted and brainwashed into doing the bidding of government officials as part of a top-secret mind control program, so now that he's older, why not put him in the White House to soften press briefings to make the president look better? The suggestion for many is that Gannon is a monarch program child-turned-adult operative. Gannon, according to investigators like Skolnick, is involved in high-profile high-level espionage, and is also an expert on torture. He is said to have been an expert penetration agent using sex to compile negative data on U.S. and foreign government officials, and is also believed responsible for the Valerie Plame White House leak that allegedly caused 70 CIA undercover agents to be murdered. I mean, wow. I mean, what a tangled web this is. Yet others suggest that Gosh took on the persona of James Gannon, Jeff Guckert, and gained White House access with the eventual goal of exposing the people who kidnapped him and put him and his family through hell. Gannon is alleged to have a publishing deal with a Russian imprint, which some believe will result in a tell-all book that exposes those who paid for his services, as well as the pedophile ring that he, as Gosh, was victimized by after his kidnapping. I'm convinced 99% that he is Johnny Gosh, says Ted Gunderson, a retired FBI agent who has been working on the Gosh case for more than a decade. The only way I'd be 100% sure if there was a DNA test or if he admitted it. He bases his opinion on a confidential source from whom he claims to have a videotaped testimony that has him identifying Gannon as Gosh. My source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Johnny Gosh, says Gunderson. Let's just say he's in a position to know the kids are all in touch with each other and it's a bond they all share. Again, like, what does it take to fool former FBI head Ted Gunderson with experience in all of these trafficking and missing children's cases, satanic expose? I mean, th this guy clearly has a lot of experience in this dark world. And just as an investigator. The kids he refers to are those forced into the sex slavery rings in the government-sponsored mind and behavioral control programs. One of those kids is a man named Paul Bonacci, who claims to have participated in the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh and says he was forced to be the first person to molest Johnny. Bonacci has long claimed to be part of the vast network of children trained to work for the government and participate in deviant sexual acts to make the blackmail of politicians possible. 
1999, Bonacci won a $1 million lawsuit against Larry King, the former head of the Franklin Credit Union in Nebraska, whom he claimed forced him into the pedophile ring. The federal judge ruled Bonacci was truthful in his testimony, which included that he was one of several young male prostitutes known to have toured the White House in the 1980s. Gunderson claims that Bonacci is not his source for the Gannon is Gosh claim, but adds that Bonacci informed him a while back that Gosh had changed his appearance. John DeCamp, author of the Franklin cover-up, says Bonacci told him the same thing. Yeah, we have multiple people corroborating this testimony here. I do know that Johnny Gosh altered his appearance and the changes I've heard about conform to how Gannon looks now, he says. Paul told me you could be standing right next to him and not know it's Johnny. But here's the thing, though. Gannon does look exactly like Johnny, though. And he says that Gannon has been asked the questions but he refuses to answer one way or another. A fellow in New York City went to his door and asked him about his mother in Iowa. And he... Wait, 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 wait. Wait, what? Gannon's mother's from Iowa? Or she's not, and the reporter just phrased it that way, as if it's Noreen Gosh. A fellow in New York City went to his door, asked him about his mother in Iowa, and he slammed the door on him. He says he wouldn't talk about it at all. A mother's instinct. Noreen Gosh has seen the videotape that Gunderson made with his confidential informant and believes the man is credible. Ted sent me a videotape of his interview with his source, and he said Gannon is Gosh. And he said it without hesitation, without blinking an eye, recalls Noreen, and he's... He said he's known it for months. When the theory was first proposed, Noreen's phone was ringing every 15 minutes from calls from bloggers, investigators, and radio and TV stations, all asking if she would identify Gannon as her son. She has not done so. She sat with numerous photos from the internet and compared them to those of Johnny herself and John Gosh Sr. looking for similar features. I could see some of the similarities that the bloggers were talking about, she says. I could see in Gannon the features that Johnny had. And the last time I saw Paul Bonacci, he told me that Johnny had changed his entire appearance again. That he shaved his head and is going with that look for now. Okay, so apparently Bonacci told, so Bonacci told Noreen before Gannongate that he had shaved his head and went with a different look. And this is corroborated by multiple other people, like DeCamp and Gunderson. So before Jeff Gannon was even a thing, Paul Bonacci said he, went with, he, he shaved his head and he has a different look. I mean, that's curious. Again, that doesn't prove it's Gannon, but it's curious. She says the birthmark on Johnny's chest is very similar to a mark seen on Gannon's chest in at least one photo. She also points that Gannon has a spot on his right cheek in the same place as Johnny. Sometimes she's almost convinced, but it's, it's not quite enough, and she just can't or won't say for sure that Gannon is her son. People have asked me why can't I recognize him if I saw him in 97. And I tell them a picture from the internet is a lot different than someone sitting in your kitchen, she says. Noreen claims that Johnny visited her at his West Des Moines apartment in 97, but told her he could not come out of hiding because his life and hers would be put in grave danger. But what about her gut feeling, her maternal instinct? Honestly, it changes, she says. Sometimes I think, oh yeah, that looks like him, and other times the jump is too much to think about it. When you factor in the facts, it's hard to believe. I've spent a lot of sleepless nights over this. I really wish I could say for sure. So here's the thing. Those claiming Noreen is just out for attention or whatever, she seems to be honest about everything. I mean, just dissecting all her statements. Again, in the previous episode, we went over a lot of them. So, I mean, it seems like she's honest. And is the reason why her maternal instinct is changing is because of the split personalities and all of the mind control. I mean, again, I don't know how that would factor into instinct, but if she's seeing this Gannon guy and, and he's so different from her actual son, but then maybe other times he's not or there's flickers, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is all very, very mind shocking. But Noreen is no fool. She knows the risk of saying one way or the other if she thinks this is her son. If it is, and he's chosen not to say anything, she understands that he has his reasons for his secrecy and that are likely life-threatening and her outing him could very well put him at risk. If she were to claim Gannon is Johnny and is proven wrong later, then any amount of credibility she has left would go out the window. Even if he, Gannon, admitted to it, I would still want a DNA test done, she says. This is so surreal, it's like I'm on the outside looking in. Almost 23 years have passed, and we know he's still alive, but to potentially have your loved one found is just unreal. 
If this would turn out to be Johnny, it would be a blessing for everyone to know what happened and have it all wrapped up. Subliminal hints. That is unlikely to happen anytime soon. Despite millions of words devoted to the subject on the web and investigations being conducted by hundreds of internet detectives, Gannon has not acknowledged the speculation. Despite this, some say that Gannon has been providing clues to his real identity on his webpage, jeffgannon.com, which is still active. Uh, no longer, but at the time. Shortly after the theory was presented, Gannon posted an article titled, Hiding in Plain Sight. Wait, wait, wait. He posted it after the theory was presented? Huh. And posted a column entitled, Fear and Loathing in the Press Room, which some suggest is a reference to the recently deceased Hunter S. Thompson, who also was accused of involvement in pedophile child slavery in the 1980s. Wow. Oh, man. And the connection to Bonacci's claim about the snuff film of Bohemian Grove. I mean, this is a lot of coincidences here. I mean, it's a lot. Others suggest that his name itself is a clue to his real identity. Both Jeff Gannon and James Guckert share the same initials as Johnny Gosh. Furthermore, shortly after Johnny's disappearance, Noreen made a personal plea to the editor of the Des Moines Register, Johnny's employer. The editor printed her letter in the paper and mocked it by allowing the police department to dissect it. The editor's name was James Gannon. Is this all too mind-shocking for people? I would say those are subliminal messages, says Gunderson, an attempt on Gannon's part to let slip his identity. Jim Rothstein, a retired New York police detective who spent more than 35 years on the force, much of it investigating child slavery and pedophile rings, agrees that the evidence is strong that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh. To me, Gannon looks like Johnny, says Rothstein. Everything just fits. The profile, the MO, everything. Rothstein has been involved as a private investigator on the Gosh case for the past several years, and he is working to get the final proof needed to determine Gannon's true identity. We're working on getting a tail on him and getting a DNA sample to test, he says. I still can't figure out why no one knows where he, Gannon, was for 10 years. Why would he announce that, like, in an article, that they're going to tail him and get a DNA test? Although, I mean, you know, I mean, how hard can that be to do? There have been some internet postings that gave a timeline of Gannon's life, but according to Rothstein, they are based on flimsy information that is not to be trusted. Records are easy to create. Maybe this guckered kid died and someone took over his identity. If it is not Johnny Gosh, then it is one of the other kids like Johnny Gosh. Noreen says, if this is all true, I don't think he was ready to be exposed just yet. Hunter and Snuff Films. The Gannon Gosh connection was first made public in the early morning, February 20th. Later the same day, Hunter S. Thompson was found dead in his home, the victim of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot. Few people would ever thought to connect Thompson and Gosh, but those familiar with the tales of child abuse and pedophilia documented in the Franklin cover-up, a book first released in 1994 by former Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp, understand the association. In his book, DeCamp relates many interviews and discussions with Paul Bonacci, the man who claims to have been involved with the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. Bonacci told horrific tales of being forced into sex with adults and other children. In one case, he recalls being flown into Nevada with another young boy whom he did not know. They took on another passenger there and headed to a secluded location where Bonacci says he was forced to have sex with a younger boy. The young boy, Bonacci claims in his book, was also forced to have sex with adult males, and then they killed the boy with a gunshot to the head. Bonacci says he was then forced to have sex with the corpse. The passenger they took on in Nevada filmed the entire thing, and Bonacci recalled that his name was Hunter Thompson. I think it's kind of strange that Hunter Thompson would commit suicide at this time, says Gunderson. Several kids told us that he directed snuff films. I think it's a strong possibility that he was murdered, and I strongly suspect that it's all connected. That's, in, that's an interesting statement from Ted Gunderson as well, because if other people have been blowing the whistle on Thompson for quite some time, you would think if he was going to commit suicide over the first instance he would have, or the second or the third or whatever. But now, as soon as there's a gosh Gannon connection... Now he chooses to do it. I mean, it could be unrelated again, but it's just a coincidence here. And the speculation on the internet has been that Thompson was either killed to prevent his coming forward or that he killed himself because he feared his role as a director of child snuff films would be proven true. 
De Camp also expressed some surprise at the timing of Thompson's death and says he still believes Bonacci's claim is true. Stevenson, the blogger from Seattle who has investigated the Gosh case, is also suspicious. I wonder, did he know? In light of Paul Bonacci's testimony regarding the snuff film, I submit he knew quite a bit, he says. The timing of his death was interesting. The snuff film that Thompson allegedly made with Paul Bonacci is believed based on Bonacci's description of the surroundings to have been filmed at Bohemian Grove, a summer camp of sorts for the rich and powerful. Bohemian Grove is a secluded area outside Sacramento, California, IA, where world leaders and dignitaries meet annually for a retreat that involves neo-pagan activities, including mock human sacrifices, or allegedly mock, made before a large owl statue referred to as Moloch. While conducting the ritual, which they call the cremation of care, participants are dressed in druid robes and chant and sing before Moloch. Information on these gatherings has been known for some time, although video footage has only been leaked out of the site, only recently been leaked out of the site. The site is very secure and access available only to a handful of people worldwide. As a child, Bonacci could never have had access to the site, but he described it accurately, including the large owl statue. I mean, that is so damning. All right, here's another mind shock. Noreen Gosh says that on one recent evening, her website, johnnygosh.com, had more than 50 hits that came from within a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove. So keep in mind, Sacramento is over 100 miles from, Bo from Bohemian Grove. San Francisco is 75 miles. And Santa Rosa is over twenty miles. That might be the that might be the the biggest city. I think someone local to that area of Bohemian Grove can chime in here. But so there don't appear to be any big cities. So this is pretty much the middle of nowhere retreat, or with just small towns or cities, really small within a ten mile radius of Bohemian Grove. So these are not people from major cities looking up JohnnyGosh.com. These are more than 50 hits from a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove out in the woods. What does that mean? I don't know. What do all the coincidence theorists think about that? The CIA pedophile. In her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, Noreen Gosh writes about a man who contacted her just six months after Johnny's disappearance, claiming he worked with a government agency that was investigating pedophile organizations. George Paul Bishop, often known as just Paul Bishop, claimed he was a CIA asset and arrived in Des Moines in July 84 to offer his assistance to the Goshes. Before he left, he provided, through his investigation, a detailed map of the kidnapping scene. Bishop, according to Noreen's book, often called the Gosh home from the Washington, D.C. office of Senator Charles Grassley, with whom Noreen had worked on Johnny's case. Many times, Paul Bishop would call me from Senator Grassley's office, and when he finished speaking with me, he would hand the phone to one of Grassley's aides, who I was familiar with, Noreen recalled in her book published in 2000. That convinced me Paul was an accepted visitor on the Hill in Washington. Based on this, Noreen believed that Bishop was responsible for securing her invitation to testify before Senator Arlen Specter's hearing on organized crime and its relationship to kidnapping at the U.S. Capitol. Bishop, in fact, picked Noreen up from her D.C. hotel and accompanied her to the hearings. Bishop became close to Noreen, even referring to her as mom. What? But suddenly, in 1985, he disappeared from the scene. The phone number he'd left was no longer valid, and no one knew how to contact him. No one had seen or heard from him in almost 20 years until he was suddenly arrested on February 4th of this year in Virginia, after police allegedly found an explicit video of a 16-year-old boy in his home. Detectives searched Bishop's home and found the tape after receiving a complaint that he was allowing teenage boys to drink and use drugs on the premises. Noreen wonders now if Bishop was on the wrong side of Johnny's case all along. Was he involved in the kidnapping and merely running a smokescreen at the time to prevent discovery? Was his recent arrest an effort to keep him quiet about the larger story a threat? So this is all from the unfolding of, the, of, of Gannon possibly being gosh. This is weird. Or was he honest from the beginning and his, arre his recent arrest merely an effort to discredit him before he reappeared and started making noise and threatening to expose the powerful people involved? 
Either way, Bishop seemed to know a lot about Johnny's disappearance in 1982 and his sudden appearance on the scene coinciding with the outing of Jeff Gannon and the death of Thompson and the arrest of another man involved with the case below is too much of a coincidence for some to accept. It's very common to set someone up and arrest him to discredit him, says Rothstein. The photographer. Okay, so here's going to be the Paul Bishop aside, because we touched upon him in the first one or two episodes, and some believe he's he was working for the CIA. Very, very shady. So let's go a little deeper into George Paul Bishop here. This is from johnnygoshtruth.blogspot.com, January 4, 2009, uncovering the Johnny Gosh case. Meet George Paul Bishop, a convicted and currently incarcerated 49-year-old pedophile in Fairfax Adult Detention Center located in Virginia. Arrested on August 19, 2005 for child pornography, he was due for release in March 2008, but was apparently incarcerated again for not registering as a sex offender. He is listed as violent. Most people know him as Paul Bishop, a profound figure central to the early investigation into the disappearance of Johnny Gosh. Noreen Gosh says within six months of Johnny's disappearance, September 5, 1982, a young man named Paul Bishop had contacted her, arrived in Des Moines, Iowa, and claimed he was a CIA asset, reachable via a phone number connected to Langley Air Force Base. And how often in missing persons cases does a CIA asset with a Langley Air Force Base phone number come to assist the family? Wow. Is he connected to... Uh, Aqu Michael Aquino, the uh, the Air Force individual, w who the, the self-admitted Satanist, the open Satanist who was allegedly involved in human trafficking, and was this an attempt to keep close tabs on the investigation? Most notably, Paul had informed Noreen Gosh of an agency acknowledged pedophile ring he claimed had kidnapped her son Johnny Gosh and then drew her a detailed map supposedly outlining the planned kidnapping in question. According to Noreen Gosh, Paul Bishop was also the instrumental figure in securing her trip to Washington, D.C. for the purpose of testifying before Congress about her son's case for Senator Arlen Specter, as well as personally accompanying her with two unknown men to the U.S. Capitol building. Or is, was Paul Bishop the good guy here? And was he going rogue against these criminal elements of the government, against their knowledge? in order to expose all of this? And if so, was he framed for all of these crimes to discredit him? But anyway, continuing on here, after the disappearance of local newspaper boy Eugene Martin in 1984, Paul Bishop had informed Noreen Gosh that a local PI in contact with her, Sam Soda, was in the West Des Moines area and somehow involved with a kidnapping. So allegedly here, Paul Bishop is the one who first told Noreen Gosh that Sam Soda it might be involved. Apparently, Sam Soda held a high distrust and suspicion of Paul, Bish from the, Paul Bishop from the beginning, and Noreen Gosh claims there's an audio tape brought to law enforcement. She claims they simply refuse to listen to it of Sam Soda warning of an impending second kidnapping in Des Moines shortly before Eugene Martin disappeared. As a side note, there is exactly zero evidence of the existence of such a tape. I mean, is there, wasn't there one officer who said he listened to it? Since then, Noreen Gosh has claimed Paul Bonacci, like after the fact or something? Since then, Noreen Gosh has claimed Paul Bonacci positively identified Sam Soda as being involved in photographing Johnny Gosh shortly before his kidnapping. And again, was that a man and a woman who were both photographing him? After Paul Bishop had told Noreen Gosh that Sam Soda was involved in the disappearance of Eugene Martin, Noreen claims Sam was instrumental in subpoenaing Paul Bishop to testify to a federal grand jury hearing about his whereabouts and activities in Des Moines. This comes after Paul Bishop supposedly visits Sam Soda's office, where he is promptly kicked out. Okay, so this possible CIA asset with an Air Force, uh, Langley Air Force Base phone number, he went, he actually went to Sam Soda's office and Sam Soda kicked him out. And is Sam Soda, like, what's Sam Soda connected to? Because if he's involved in this ring, I mean, who's the good guy here? Or are they both the bad guys? Noreen further claims that she had questioned Paul Bishop after he had taken a taxi to her home in West Des Moines interrupted by Sam Soda's phone calls demanding to know where Bishop was. 
And then Noreen organizes Paul's overnight stay at a friend's residence. So Sam Soda is calling Noreen, demanding to know where Paul Bishop is. And why is Sam Soda not afraid of this possible CIA asset? It's like he's trying to track him down. After he had supposedly traveled back to D.C. two days later, apparently under the false identity Robert Levesque, she had received two calls from him and has since never heard from him again. Lastly, she claims the phone number Paul Bishop had given her to Langley Air Force Base was no longer valid. So wait a second, it was valid initially? So what happened to George Paul Bishop since then? Okay, wait a second. So trying to dissect the timeline here. So Paul Bishop, highly involved, then Paul Bishop visits Sam Soda, apparently gets kicked out, then Sam Soda calls Noreen Gosh at home demanding to know where Bishop is. Then Bishop goes back to D.C. allegedly, calls Noreen Gosh two more times, then disappears forever. This is weird. Police arrest two on child porn charges by Matthew Perrone. A complaint about excessive comings and goings of teenage boys at a Chantilly house led this week to the arrest of two Fairfax County men for child pornography offenses, Richard Evans of Annandale and George Bushop of Chantilly, who's co who co-manage a literary website, were both arrested by Fairfax County Police on Friday, January 28th. Police started investigating Bishop 46 after they received a complaint that he was allegedly inviting teenage boys to come to his house to, to drink alcohol and to take illegal narcotics. On January 7th, Detective Peter Charles of the Fairfax County Police Department served Bishop with a search warrant at his home in Chantilly. According to the warrant, in their search, Charles and other officers seized computer hard drives, letters, pictures, and a videotape showing a young man posing nude while dressed in bondage gear. Police identified the young man in the video as a 16-year-old resident of Cent Centerville. Bishop appeared in the video with another older man who was bald and a long, bushy white beard. After examining emails that refer to a man who looks a lot like Merlin, police identified Richard Wendell Evans, 66, as the second man in the video. When police searched Evans' home in Annandale, they found various sex toys, sex toys digital cameras, and a leather hat and vest. According to the search warrant, following his arrest, Bishop told officers that he and Evans were co-creators of the website DeweyWriter.com. Bishop was actually working on the website when police came to his house on January 7th. The search warrant described DeweyWriter.com as primarily a literary website with online books posted by authors with names like Dewey, Graham, Ryan Keith, Sterling, Grasshopper, and Carolina Shribbler. One of the books by Dewey is titled For the Love of Pete and bears a dedication in its middle chapters. The author writes, I'd like to dedicate this chapter to all the boys out there who were never allowed to be children when they were kids. May you find the child in you long before I found the child in me. What the heck? Was, was Paul Bishop possibly a trafficked kid himself earlier? And he wanted to blow the whistle on this? So he was some kind of an asset by this criminal organization, possibly in the CIA. And then he wants to blow the whistle on all this because that was him. And that's why he was so... Uh, Connected to the Johnny Gosh case? As of February 1st, the website had more than 270,000 hits and featured links to several chat rooms. Both men were released the day of their arrest. Bishop, who was charged with six counts of possession of child pornography and two counts of manufacturing child pornography, was released on an $8,000 bond. Evans was charged with one count of manufacturing child pornography and was released on a $2,500 bond. This is from Times Community Newspapers 2007. Okay, so Bishop pleads guilty to producing and possessing by Bonnie Hobbs. Thursday, June 30th, 2005. After being indicted by the grand jury in May, a Chantilly man pled guilty as charged Monday morning in Fairfax County Circuit Court. He is George Paul Bishop, 46. Do you fully understand the nature of the charges against you today? Asked Judge Leslie Alden. Yes, Your Honor, replied Bishop. Are you entering your pleas of guilt because you are guilty of these charges? She asked again. He replied affirmatively. Hmm. So, okay, so if he's not guilty, would he just say he is because he knows they're going to kill him if he doesn't? Is that, I mean, is, is that what some people allege? Hmm. And Evans pled guilty as well. Okay, and there's just a bunch more articles here. So in this August 26, 2005 article... So Bishop sentenced Friday three years in prison. The parents of one of his victims testified against him. So this is mostly concerning the tape and video he made of a teenage boy in bondage gear. The parents testified whose son alerted the police to what was going on. 
Okay. So, okay. Something weird's going on here. This is a troubling case, said Mooney. Look at the pre-sentencing investigation and what the defendant says about his account of what happened. He wants the court to believe the minor was dressed up as a male slave because he wanted to dress that way for Halloween. He says it was consensual and he was just being a nice guy and providing the outfit and the environment. He denies giving minors drugs and alcohol and takes no responsibility for it, she continues. And he says making the tape was stupid and a simple mistake. He was 46 and he has prior criminal convictions. He'd be more believable if he didn't have them. Mooney revealed that in 88, Bishop had two felony convictions in California IA for oral copulation with a minor, plus an assault conviction in Fairfax County after he lifted a 12-year-old paper boy's shirt and kissed his stomach. What? A paper boy? So in eight, this is in 1988, in the 80s. What? This is really weird with Paul Bishop here. So if that's all true and all these previous offenses are true, that does not look good for Bishop. So here's a quote from, uh, from Bishop. Bishop stood, said he regretted the three charges and had, had pled guilty to them. Quote, I am not a predator or a pedophile, he said. I don't have a proclivity for 17-year-olds. When I had a problem 20 years ago, I resolved it. Then I don't feel I'm a threat to the community. So is he basically admitting his previous problem here while he was assisting in the Gosh case? What is going on here? What? I mean, this gets even worse. So P Paul Bishop was also arrested between September 84 and September 85 in Alexandria, Virginia, for having sex with a 12-year-old boy at an Oakwood ap apartment complex. Soon after, he fled to California, but returned to Virginia after charges were filed against him there before disappearing again up to his arrest and incarceration in 2005. So wait a second. So he's a possible CIA asset while assist... Okay, so he this was before that. September 84, he was arrested? between 80 when was he assisting with the gosh case like so this is really weird so again from the blog here let's summarize what's going on here a longtime pedophile and child pornographer George Paul Bishop approaches Noreen gosh shortly after her son's kidnapping to inform her he is a CIA asset and how is he in this co how is he in this uh, office in DC? Like what the heck's going on here? And has information about an underground network conspiracy that has kidnapped Johnny Gosh. According to Noreen, he is supposed he supposedly can be contacted at a phone number traced to Langley. And organized her testimony to a congressional hearing about her son's case in DC. What is rarely mentioned was that George Paul Bishop was a child molester and admitted pedophile during all of this associating with other pedophiles like Richard Evans, who had a record of aggravated sexual assault toward a minor in 1984, up to producing child pornography of his victims in 2005. What do the disturbing latter facts have to do with Noreen Gosh? Apparently, Noreen and her camp aren't shy at all about endorsing George Paul Bishop as a heroic whistleblower of sorts, a CIA asset which provided facts that they claim proved true in their ensuing private investigations into the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. How do they answer George Paul Bishop's obvious record of child molestation, pedophilia, and child pornography charges since the 80s? They don't, or sometimes they claim it's some kind of CIA operation frame-up. All right, here's the thing, though. Let's say it's not a frame-up, because if Bishop is part of was also one of these kidnapped children. So he has all these mental issues, and he is guilty of all of this, of just repeating these cycles. Does that, and, and, and maybe possibly also has multiple personality dis disorders, like, like Bonacci does. Like, because Bonacci, again, guilty of all these things he said he was. I mean, is this, yeah, th this is actually kind of crazy, because is that the case, where he is self-admittedly guilty of all these things due to what happened to him, and he's still trying to help and blow the whistle, similar to Bonacci? I mean, is that true? All right, so that's what we have on Bishop. Now, let's go back to the previous article. So, Bishop, just the timeline here, regarded Gannon might be gosh, Thompson. Now we're moving on here to the photographer. Rusty Nelson claimed that he once turned down an offer of $50,000 from Hunter S. Thompson to help in the production of a snuff film. The offer was allegedly made because Nelson worked closely with Larry King, the central figure 
in the Franklin cover-up, accused of running a pedophile and child slavery ring. Nelson would often accompany King to elaborate parties where he worked as a photographer, taking photos of high-profile individuals in compromising positions with young boys and girls. Nelson testified in court that he participated as a photographer, but claims that he took compromising photos he never took any hardcore pornographic pictures, that he absolutely refused any involvement with child pornography. But he claims that King employed a Nelson lookalike for this purpose in order to compromise the powerful people in the photos and Nelson himself. What? Nelson has admitted taking tens of thousands of photos, many of which have been confiscated and either destroyed or permanently sealed to protect those depicted. But many, according to some reports, remain hidden. Despite his denials, Nelson has served time for his photography work, having been arrested in Oregon years ago with a van full of photos, at least one of which was said to involve a minor engaged in less than legal activity. He's been living in Nebraska for some time, providing what information he can to PIs and trying to put his life back together. More recently, he was working with a friend to open a studio that specializes in wedding photography. But two days after Thompson's death, Nelson was rounded up by police and arrested reportedly for failing to register as a sex offender in a county of which he was no longer a resident. John DeCamp bailed Nelson out of jail and says he thinks the arrest was intended as a warning to him and others that they best keep their mouths shut. Others agree. The timing is interesting, says Stevenson, especially given Thompson's death and Paul Bishop's recent arrest. I would place a suicide watch on both men. I think there's fixin' to be a heap of manure hitting the air circulating device soon, he said. I wonder about the timing. I've been wondering why all of these people have all of a sudden come out of the woodwork. I wonder if there is a purge going on. I don't think injustice ever leaves the public consciousness. I think there is far more going on here than we know. So why now, after all this time, why the activity and renewed interest in the Johnny Gosh case and tales of child abduction, slavery, and prostitution in general? Did the theory that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh hit too close to home and threaten to expose those with secrets to keep? One suggestion is that increased media attention has the players in the decades-old scandal getting jumpy and looking to protect themselves. Nick Bryant, the man who confronted Gannon at his home and asked him about Johnny Gotch, has apparently been working on this story for several years and has been shopping the finished product around for a publisher. Rothstein says he's been working with Bryant for at least three years and that Bryant was originally commissioned to do the story for Rolling Stone, which has since turned the finish piece down. The New York Times and several other outlets have reportedly shown interest in the story recently as well. Bryant declined to comment either on the Gannon situation or his involvement in writing a story. But Rothstein says that Bryant began showing the piece around the players involved have once again become active. Something is cooking here now, he says. They'll have to throw someone to the wolves, but there's no telling how high it will go. Everyone involved in the story acknowledges that it sounds like a wacky conspiracy theory, but the evidence of the conspiracy is too vast, they say, to simply dismiss it. It's, I'm a conspiracy realist, because there is conspiracy out there, says Gunderson, who says just two weeks ago he was chased through his neighborhood by an unknown man with a gun. What? Adds Rothstein, if two people were involved in kidnapping that kid, then it's a conspiracy. Well, these people don't work alone, so it's a conspiracy. Then try to discredit you by calling you a conspiracy theorist. Damn right I'm a conspiracy theorist, because that's what it is. Still, in the end, this is a story about a young boy stolen from his home and family. This simple tragedy is often lost in the complicated theories and conjecture, but it remains the single undeniable truth in the entire story. I hold out hope that we'll be able to have regular communications with him, Noreen says of her son. We know he's alive, and up until a few years ago, we knew what he was doing and where. What? Nor Noreen said, we know he's alive, and up until a couple years ago, we knew what he was doing and where. Maybe he could keep in touch with his mom, but moving back to Des Moines to live a life here, those windows of opportunity have closed. I hear the horrible things people say about me. I can only imagine what they would say about him, given the things he's been through. Johnny knows I tried, and who's to say it's all over? We don't know yet. If this is it, we're in the final days, and this is going to all this is going to blow wide open. So that's curious. So Noreen said that up until a few years ago. So now keep in mind, this article is April 6, 2005. So she's stating up until a few years ago, she knew what he was doing and where. 
So apparently there was some kind of contact after the visit. Okay, let's take another step back. Now we're going to the Rents article, which referenced this article that we just went over. But continuing on here with Rents, the bottom line is this. There is enough credible evidence linking Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh for Noreen and her private investigators to insist on a DNA test. The credible evidence phase of this case has passed. It's now a case of obtaining conclusive evidence. To her credit, Noreen has always maintained that she didn't know beyond a shadow of a doubt if Gannon was or wasn't her son, Johnny. But she'd like to know. And I believe she deserves to know whichever way it turns out. So here's an interview with Noreen Gosh linked here. Also on Rent.com. I mean... Some more interesting details here, which are problematic. So Charlene Fossa, the author of the article I just went over on rents, is interviewing her here. So she asks, Is, isn't this the first time Jeff Gannon has publicly stated that he's not Johnny Gosh? Why now? So Michael Corbin here on the Closer Look Denver-based radio talk show stated that uh, Gannon denied, officially denied that he's Gosh, and offered to Noreen Gosh to take a DNA test. Developments will follow. So this is the interview in the aftermath here. Charlene, okay, so isn't this the first time Gannon has publicly stated that he's not Gosh? Why now? Noreen responds, I think Gannon needs to continue the publicity and is now coming forward on the DNA only to keep somewhat of a spotlight on himself. Charlene responds, even though you've always publicly maintained that you didn't know if Gannon was gosh, Gannon has threatened to sue you on three different occasions. Why? What types of contact have you had with Jeff Gannon? Noreen says, I have only had email communication with Gannon. He threatened to sue me because I have stated I do not know if Gannon is or is not Johnny. He claims that it is throwing doubt into the minds of people who would otherwise say he is not Johnny. I would think he would want the DNA test, and if he is not Johnny, then state it publicly and be done with it. Charlene says, I understand there are some unique physical characteristics that Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh share. What are they? There are many facial features and the basic structure of his face, which are similar to Johnny. The color of his eyes and reports of a birthmark on Gannon is the same as Johnny's. I have not seen the birthmark, however. So that was at the time of the interview, and then supposedly after she did see it, and she said it was in the same spot. Charlene says, For many internet researchers and bloggers, they appear to be numerous reasons to suspect that Gannon and Gosh are the same person. For starters, the name Jeff Gannon seems to be related to Johnny Gosh in a twisted sort of way. Would you explain the name game and how it relates to other players and Johnny? Noreen states, It appears all of the aliases names Gannon has used that he has kept the same initials as Johnny. J. D. G. Oh, wow. We didn't even look at that before. So Johnny got... It's John David Gosh. And he's James D. D G Guckert. What? So even the middle name has the same initial. Wow. So these games being played here, they're even worse than I thought. He's even got the same middle initial. Wow. Noreen continues here. Gannon also chose the last name of the Des Moines Register editor at the time Johnny was kidnapped. There just seems to be a replay constantly of Johnny's initials or clues that link Gannon to parts of Johnny's life. Charlene states, besides the physical attributions and JDG initials pattern, what other linkages, revelations between Gannon and Johnny may have compelled you and your team to propose a DNA test to be administered to Gannon in order to achieve closure on the Gannon-Gosh issue? Noreen states, there have been two informants who have stated Gannon and Johnny are one and the same person. For me, the only way that could possibly resolve is a DNA test. That is the reason my investigative team have asked for a DNA test. Charlene states, I understand you've verified that Johnny had plastic surgery about four years ago. And coincidentally, he also started shaving his head around the same time. Noreen states, yes. Long before Gannon surfaced, I had learned that Johnny had plastic surgery and bega begun to shave his head. So when Gannon did come on the scene, it was one more thing to consider. Charlene asks, not long ago in an internet radio interview, I heard Rusty Nelson, Larry King's ex-private pedophile ring photographer, speaking about, among other things, Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh. Unfortunately, Rusty Nelson's story is beyond the scope of this interview. Suffice to say, in order to survive and out of sheer desperation, 
Rusty managed to escape from Larry King's clutches and is currently on the lam. Naturally, having been King's private photographer, Nelson knew Johnny. During the interview, Nelson offered his opinion on whether or not he thought Johnny Gosh was Jeff Gannon. To paraphrase, he volunteered that he felt close to certain that they were one and the same person. He followed up with an anecdotal story about having serendip serendipitously bumped into Johnny Gosh several years at a farmer's market. I can't recall where. It seems to me that Rusty Nelson is qualified to speculate on the matter. Were you aware of his conjecture? Have you been in contact with Rusty Nelson? Okay, hold on a second here. Hold on a second here. So former FBI head Ted Gonderson believes 99% that Gannon is gosh. DeCamp believes Gannon is gosh. Bonacci supposedly stated Gannon is gosh. There's another confidential source who stated definitively that Gannon is gosh. And now Rusty Nelson is stating that he bumped into gosh years ago, several years ago to Farmer's Market, and is also stating that Gannon is gosh. I mean, that's a lot of people with direct connections to the case. Some of the people who directly knew Johnny before, and, well, I mean, all of them, if you believe, Rusty Nelson and Bonacci, but, and this other guy. I mean, this is crazy. This is a lot of directly connected people stating they believe that Gannon is gosh. Wow, what does everybody make of that? So, continuing on with the interview here, have you been in contact with Rusty Nelson? Noreen states, I have been in contact with Rusty and have known him for years. He has shared a great deal of information with us and testified in federal court in 1999 as to all of these events. He told me nearly four years ago that he had seen Johnny at the farmer's market in a particular city, so she did not reveal which one here. Wow. Wow. Charlene states, as of, yet, as of late, you've been in contact with the Franklin kids. There are children from the Des Moines and Omaha area who were also abducted and MK altered into Larry King's International Elite Controlled Pedophile Ring around the same time Johnny was. Some of these survivors are no doubt members of the original 83 children who came forward to testify about their horrific abuse in the Franklin case. Of course, like Johnny, these children are now approaching 40 years of age, but they are most likely developmentally arrested to greater or lesser degrees emotionally frozen at the age they were abducted and ritually traumatized. Can you share with us what these survivors, the, victim of King, the victims of King's pedophile ring, are telling you of their horrific ordeal and their feelings about the future? Noreen states, I have been in touch with a number of the Franklin kids. Many have shared information with me. They continue communication to this day. For a number of them, their lives have been broken as children who are victims of these crimes. It is true they are now all approaching 40 years of age. Many are fed up, angry about what happened to them and how their lives have been robbed. Some want to do something about it, and others are still very afraid for themselves and their loved ones. Charlene says, I believe that you said some of these survivors feel like they've been programmed to do something in the future, but they don't know what it is. It sounds like a group of sleeper Manchurian candidate cells that could be activated at any time for evil purposes, no doubt. Could you explain? Well, I mean, that's just when you think this case can't get any creepier. I mean, what the heck? Noreen states, it is a form of Manchurian candidate. Many feel those kids are programmed to be accessed or triggered for some future use or a project. Charlene states, many of these kids knew Johnny. Do some of the Franklin kids you've been in contact with believe Jeff Gannon is Johnny? Gosh, wow. Who, who's ready for the response here? Who's ready for this response? Noreen states here, the majority of the Franklin kids I have been in contact with do believe Jeff Gannon is Johnny. Some say they have been in communication with him on a fairly regular basis. I would suspect this is done by email on computer rather than face-to-face -face meetings. Okay. All right. So we have former FBI head Ted Gunderson investigator of many decades. He believes Gannon is gosh. We have this New York City detective who investigated child abductions and, and child trafficking in rings. He believes Gannon is gosh. DeCamp believes that Johnny gosh is now 
Gannon. Bonacci supposedly stated that Gannon is gosh. Rusty Nelson said that Gannon is gosh. And now Noreen is stating here the majority of the Franklin kids she's in contact with believe that Gannon is gosh. Wow. Charlene continues here. On the Johnny Gosh Foundation website, you describe Johnny as chameleon-like. Others have also characterized him as chameleon-like, including some of the surviving Franklin kids. Is it true that Jeff Gannon also described himself as chame chameleon-like? Noreen stated th states, Throughout this investigation, I have been trained as a private investigator. I listen for these play on words. The reference to Johnny being a chameleon was given to me by, by seven of the Franklin kids I have known. I asked them why he was considered a chameleon. They all told me it was because Johnny was a master of disguise. Gannon then began referring to himself as the chameleon. I find that to be significant. Could it be a coincidence? Coincident? Or was it given by Gannon as some kind of a clue? Gannon has also stated he has hidden in plain sight. Interesting idea. I mean, yeah, the amount of clues here being given by Gannon, I mean, it's crazy. This is crazy. Because Gannon refers to him as the chameleon. Okay, Charlene states, and then there's that pesky DNA test Gannon's been dodging. Until now, maybe. It seems Gannon has a pattern of agreeing to submit to a DNA test, only later to refuse for one reason or another. Also, most people probably aren't aware that Gannon has repeatedly stipulated various conditions that need to be met by your team as part of his agreeing to a DNA, te DNA test. Can you summarize the history of DNA negotiations with Gannon up to and including the current agreement? So Noreen states, in March 2005, shortly after this story broke about Gannon, I wrote to him by email three times to ask him to quietly agree to a DNA test to resolve the situation. Gannon did not answer my emails. We then sent a gentleman representing me to Gannon's home to talk with him. Gannon answered the door when the man asked him about a DNA and told he was there on behalf of the woman in Iowa, Gannon slammed the door on the man. We later were on a network TV show in which Gannon said he would take a DNA test only to later develop all kinds of stipulations. One, that the results should be kept private, no problem there. Two, that I would be required to make a statement saying he was not my son and sign documents agreeing not to ever mention his name in public. I mean, that's actually kind of curious because if it comes back positive, she would still be required to make a public statement saying he was not her son and sign these documents agreeing never to mention his name in public. That's an interesting uh, stipulation. Three, that Gannon would publicly make some declaration of spiritual support for me. Okay, that's weird. Four, finally, that Gannon go forward to be a national speaker for missing children. I mean, that's kind of, this is kind of weird though, because, so she's directly involved in, uh, in NamUs and, and a lot of these organizations for missing children, and there's a stipulation that she would never be allowed to say his name, but that he would be a national speaker for missing children. Unless, again, he might just be playing games this entire time. So continuing on here, some of these conditions were absurd. To date, Gannon agreed to do the DNA on Michael Corbin's show and then has stalled once again. The DNA test is now in limbo for a while. Charlene asks, did Gannon ever ask to be paid for taking a DNA test? Noreen says, yes, at one time he stated he wanted to be paid big bucks for his DNA sample. I rejected that idea, but offered to pay for the actual test. Okay, so he wanted money for a sample, but not a test. So what does that mean? He provides a sample, which may or may not be his. Also, if Gannon has all these multiple personalities, is it possible he thinks he's not Johnny Gosh again and he's speaking with Noreen that way? Even if he is, he thinks he's not. Charlene states, As I recall, your longtime PI, Mr. Rothstein, who is a retired New York City detective, is now in charge of the DNA negotiations and logistics with Jeff Gannon. If Gannon actually follows through and submits to a DNA test, I'm sure Rothstein will ensure every step of the procedure is carefully monitored. 
Call me paranoid, but I'd be suspicious of the results if there were any unsupervised gaps breaking the chain of evidence between be the blood being drawn and the DNA al analysis. Even if the lab is reputable, elite sociopaths, the people behind Gannon, with unlimited power and money to burn, always seem to find a way to derail these well-intentioned truth-seeking investigations. I'm sure Mr. Rothstein is 20 steps ahead of me on this and has a plan in place to control as many variables as humanly possible so that Gannon's DNA test results will be bona fide. Can you comment? Noreen states that Jim Rothstein has arranged for a reliable lab to do the DNA test. We have advised Gannon of this. He, he has refused to give us the name of his attorney so we can com communicate with him to make arrangements. Charlene states, it seems obvious that Gannon is playing mind games with you regarding his willingness or lack thereof to take a DNA test. And as you've astutely surmised, this on-again, off-again DNA test scenario is free publicity for him. And I'm sure Gannon is more than capable of making good use of publicity, even if it's negative. On the other hand, if he is Johnny Gosh, taking a DNA test would undoubtedly put him in harm's way. Then again, this DNA volleyball could be part of an overall cynical strategy by Gannon and his handlers to keep the Gannon is Gosh story alive, but essentially take the energy out of it. The story continues, it limps along, but in a vapid state of limbo. This way, the character arc, the tension, and the climax of the story can be shifted to fit an agenda. Maybe this game is a backdoor approach for Gannon to gain control of the is Gannon really Gosh speculation frenzy. He knows the DNA ball will forever be in his court. If Gannon can keep the story focused at the level of a DNA test that he's never resolved, and if he can keep the public's attention focused on forensics, he's in control. And while he does his DNA dance, he can also threaten legal action against anyone who publicly wonders about the is Gannon really gosh riddle. It's a checkmate of sorts. Unless, of course, they just, you know, get his DNA from the trash. Charlene continues, a local media outlet in your region about a month ago, ran a piece on the internet site announcing that there's been significant breakthrough in the Johnny Gosh case. I think they described it as Johnny Gosh case is heating up, yet they never mentioned exactly what the breakthrough was, or I just plain missed it. However, did they mention something about the CIA and their alleged involvement in organized pedophilia? What happened to the CIA agent who had contacted you in order to help you crack the Johnny Gosh case years ago, and who was instrumental in your testifying before a congressional committee? What was the breakthrough in Johnny's case? The CIA, Noreen says, the CIA agent who resurfaced recently has brought information to Jim Rothstein, which is significant at this time. Jim shared a portion of it, which the Waterloo, Iowa TV station reported on. It was then circulated throughout the internet. He informed us that originally 1,700 children were targeted for this project. They, pedophile rings, set about kidnapping children throughout the country over a period of years. The number of usable children they ended up with was approximately 1,000. I filed a FOIA request and received a reply saying all records on Johnny's case with the CIA have vanished. Well, that doesn't sound suspicious at all. So this is kind of crazy, though. So supposedly there's uh, a CIA agent leaked info about 1,700 targeted children who were kidnapped throughout the country. This is crazy. Charlene states, after all these years, a fearful eyewitness finally came forward and detailed what really had happened to Johnny Gosh on the day he was kidnapped. He illuminated a crucial hidden aspect of Johnny's abduction. He knew Johnny wasn't a runaway. He had watched Johnny's abduction unfold from a window in the safety of his home. What's the significance of this new revelation after all these years? Could this new eyewitness report finally reopen the Johnny Gosh case? And we actually went over this testimony and the cover-up by Police Chief Orville Cooney. So I'm not going to go over all that again. Wow, this is crazy. Some more... Wow. So Charlene states, there's been some disturbing incidents and strange synchronistic events involving you and others who were or are connected to the Johnny Gosh case. Recently, there was your yearly Johnny Gosh update interview with a local radio host, a season nine-year veteran who was subsequently fired. Not long after the update interview, a strange doll was delivered to your door, and then about two days later, you heard some distressing news on the radio about a man who had revealed to you important information about your local police chief and Johnny's kidnapping. Comments. Noreen stated, Marty Stacy, an Omaha radio talk show host, did an interview with me and Jim Rothstein. During the interview, we shared the information in, que in the question answer regarding the police chief being involved in the scandal. That's the Cooney. The following day, Marty was called in by his boss and fired. The reason given was the, was the Gosh Rothstein interview. The following morning, someone placed an anatomically correct blow-up nude sex doll with dark hair and a hole blown in the head at the door of my home. 
No one saw it being placed there. The police were called and I made a police report on the situation. We consider this to be a veiled threat towards me regarding the information that I gave during the interview. Charlene asks, how many and what types of other threats and or harassment have you experienced prior to the doll incident? Noreen states that over the years I've been followed, received threatening phone calls, had men come to my home and pound on the outside of my house, throw rocks at my home. My cars have been damaged. It has been a very nerve-wracking situation, and one has to wonder why would anyone harass the mother of a missing child just looking for her child? It is because there is much more to this crime, and they are afraid I will uncover it and make it all public. Charlene asks, is there an official or unofficial body count related to the jo Franklin Johnny Gosh case? Noreen states the official body count for deaths in the Franklin Johnny case is now up to 15 deaths of witnesses and people who have come forward with information. All coincidental, probably. Charlene asks, from what you and your investigators have discovered, what have you determined about how organized pedophile rings function? For example, is it true that these rings hire professional photographers to surreptitiously photograph children and then compile these photos into catalogs so clients can choose their preferred victims? That's so creepy. Noreen stated, in August 84, I testified at a Senate hearing in Washington, D.C. It was an organized crime hearing regarding missing children. During the various testimony by myself and others, Ken Lanning of the FBI also testified. The FBI provided a catalog of materials confiscated by them during the arrest of pedophiles. There were instruction books on molesting children, torture devices, and a catalog of children who had not yet been kidnapped. A prospective buyer's guide. Another question here. Your testimony serves as an eloquent summary of the Johnny Gosh case and as a scathing indictment of government-sponsored pedophile operations. That's why I included it as part of the interview. My question, Noreen, is how did Michael Aquino specifically fit into the Johnny Gosh kidnapping? Noreen states, it was reported to me and given in federal court February 1999 by Paul Bonacci that Michael Aquino, called the colonel, was in fact the man who came to Iowa, paid the kidnappers for taking Johnny, then took Johnny with him. This took place 14 days after the kidnapping. Bonacci stated this under oath in federal court. Judge Erbaum ruled Bonacci was telling the truth. Charlene asks, in your opinion, why did Judge Urban find Paul Bonacci and the overall evidence John DeCamp presented in the court so compelling? Noreen stated, it was very surprising to us that Judge Urban would allow this process to take place since he was the same judge that stated he thought Bonacci was nuts, not credible, and not telling the truth. He did an about face. Charlene asks, any clues, guesses as to why Judge Erbaum changed his mind so abruptly? You certainly found Bonacci credible. Why? Noreen states, I have no idea why Judge Erbaum changed his mind. It still baffles all of us, including DeCamp. Paul Bonacci's information we have been able to research, verify, and prove the things he told us. This was done by a PI that DeCamp hired years ago in 89 through 2000. Charlene asks, could you connect the dots between brain wave frequencies codes multiple personality disorder and mk ultra as it relates to organized pedophilia noreen states the mind control works similar to hypnosis only much deeper levels the program they program at alpha beta theta and beyond to omega level of brainwave frequency the desired instructions for later use during the training programming there is a technique whereby the victim is split and new personalities with identities are created for desired purposes they can be activated by a keyword a song or a verbal suggestion the mind control victim will then go into what i would call an automatic pilot situation and act out exactly what had been programmed in the individual. Charlene asks, was the program called Project Monarch? Didn't Bonacci's diary contain pages and pages of codes? Noreen stated, yes, it was called Project Monarch, and Bonacci had four or five diaries with coding in it, step-by-step -step instructions on constructing a bomb, etc., and an account of all of his abuses. Charlene states, Paul Bonacci won the case. Judge Erbaum ruled that Lawrence E. King was to pay Paul Bonacci $1 million in damages. Although Mr. Bonacci has yet to collect a penny of this hard-won judgment, Paul Bonacci's court victory, especially what he conveyed about his role in the Johnny Gotch abduction, has given your investigation into Johnny's disappearance and organized pedophilia more credibility. You've been in, in touch off and on with Bonacci since 99. He's told you things about... Johnny's appearance, changes that Johnny had made to his person that are congruent with Jeff Gannon's appearance. What did he tell you when are you still in touch with him? Noreen stated, we are still periodically in touch with Minachi, but he has not made any reference to Gannon. He has stated he is in touch with Johnny, I believe, on a somewhat regular basis. From time to time, he would give me messages from Johnny. This was prior to Gannon appearing on the scene. Since Gannon Gate, there has been no more info 
on Johnny from Bonacci. That's curious as well. Although supposedly DeCamp said Bonacci told him that Gannon was gosh. Okay. So here is yet another strange coincidence. So the, the key witness in the Oakland County child murders, anyone want to guess the name? Jeff Gannon. Let's go to the cinemaholic.com Oakland County Child Killers case. Who is Jeff Gannon? Where is he now? By Kriti Marorta, December 25th, 2020. Investigation Discoveries Children of the Snow is a limited series that examines the horrifying string of homicides committed by the infamous Oakland County child killer. Between the winters of 76 and 77, four young kids, two boys, two girls, were abducted and slain in Oakland County, Michigan, with their bodies carefully laid to rest on the snow. Both the young males were sexually assaulted, whereas the females were left physically untouched, and of course, as Jeff Gannon's name is one of the most notable ones in the investigations for this case, he's been looked into as well. So this is in 70, between 76 and 77. Who is Jeff Gannon? According to a few reports, it seems like the anonymous tipster who became a common figure in the Oakland County child killer case does in fact have a name, Jeff Gannon. Whether or not even this is an alias, though, is yet to be confirmed. In 2010, he, under the name of Bob, gave an interview to the Oakland County Child Killer Task Force, wherein he claimed to know who the killer was, revealing that he had a relationship with him in 1977 as an acquaintance. As per Bob's account, there are many more victims of the child killer, and he committed all of these heinous crimes as some sort of satanic sacrifice. Bob further went on to ask the investigators if he could get information about their persons of interest and see the letter that had been mailed to them by the suspected child killer so that he could be sure that he had write the, the right man before he gave them a name. Bob's requests were denied, but he continued to meddle in the matter. Then he claimed to be an investigator who, with his team, spent over 10,000 hours over several years to examine the case. However, when asked to release his findings, he admitted that he was reluctant to do so as he doubted the competence of the Oakland officers. In 2012, Bob, with the help of Paul Hughes, an attorney representing a victim's mother, held several phone conferences intending to hand over the evidence he had accumulated. And in the end, he did so, but only to a select group of Detroit journalists. To preserve his anonymity, Bob insisted that none of the conversations be recorded. He declared that he had information linking at least a few more children to the unidentified serial killer and theorized that the perpetrator was killing so as to conduct Wiccan human sacrifices related to pagan celebrations and holidays or important dates in the lunar calendar. Where is Jeff Gannon slash Bob now? After Bob claimed that there were a total of approximately 11 to 16 victims of the Oakland County child killer, significantly more than the four that had been officially confirmed, he explained his reasoning behind it. He alleged that his team had found the other cases to be similar to the previous ones, that it was highly improbable for it to be a pure coincidence. And to be honest, his claims were seriously taken into consideration by the media, as he also said that he had worked within law enforcement in his lifetime, although he refused to reveal which division. As for who he is, or what he does, well, we're not too sure, especially as we no, have no idea what he looks like, or if Jeff Gannon is even his real name. After all, Paul Hughes himself admitted that he didn't know Bob's real identity. In fact, in all of the interviews he gave over the years, he also refused to reveal where Bob lived. All we know is in the end that all of Bob's claims were dismissed by the authorities because of lack of evidence, and that the families of the victims began feeling like Bob was trying to make a profit out of their ordeal. But did he actually, though? So here's a post to the, what we started with in the podcast, the whatever happened to the Jeff Gannon conspiracy on the, on the Reddit conspiracy sub. Commercial Work 3544 stated this a year ago. I just found something interesting while reading into the Oakland County child killer. I don't know if you're familiar, but it links to the pedo rings from the 70s and 80s in Ohio and Michigan and the Fox Island story. There is also a podcast called The Clown and the Candyman that puts it all together, but this is the first I've read about this Jeff Gannon, and in this story, and it was back in 2005, and he came from out of nowhere and tried to insert himself into this case. And if you were to believe the theory that Jeff Gannon may be Johnny Gosh, then I think this is the same Jeff Gannon. In 2005, an unidentified man 
who would later emerge to become a common figure in the case and has been referred to by the alias of Jeff, was reminded of a relationship he had in 1977 with an acquaintance. In an interview given to Oakland County investigators in 2010, Jeff informed them of atypical observations and actions while driving and conversing with the acquaintance, such as taking him to buildings where satanic rituals were allegedly performed. The acquaintance navigated through the lesser-known routes associated with the case with ease. The acquaintance also spoke of details written in Allen's letter. Jeff requested information about the Allen letter to help confirm his suspicions, but was denied. In 2010, Jeff gave a recorded interview to Oakland County investigators and prosecutor Jessica Cooper to present evidence pertaining to the investigation. Jeff claimed to have tried to approach Cooper with his findings and to convince her to place the case under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. The department was already involved through the FBI and through resources such as VICAP database. Cooper dismissed his suggestions, and as there was no new evidence presented, his request to inspect the Allen letter was denied. Cooper described the interview as a rambling statement outlining a theory that the Oakland County child killer abductions and murders were related to pagan holidays, the lunar calendar, and Wiccan rituals. Jeff proceeded to correspond with Deborah Jarvis, the mother of victim Christine Mihalik. Wow, that sounds similar to Mihalovic, the Amy Mihalovic case, Christine Mihalik, Mihalich and investigative journalists such as Bill Proctor and Heather Catalo in 2010. He claimed that he was among a team of a dozen investigators involved with the case and could identify the perpetrator of the crimes, but refused to indicate which law enforcement division he worked for. Jeff claimed to have invested 10,000 hours into the investigation over several years, but was reluctant to release his results as he doubted the competence of Wayne and Oakland County investigators. In a press release email, Jeff indicated possible meddling by Cooper and other reasons as to why he had not made his investigation public. According to Paul Hughes, an attorney representing Jarvis, Jeff's investigation discovered the murderer. However, according to Hughes, Jeff refused to identify the culprit unless the authorities divulged crucial information, which Jeff requested during the initial interviews in 2010. Jeff wanted to positively confirm the identity of a suspect using the police evidence before proceeding further. In 2012, Jeff presented his findings to a select group of Detroit journalists on Hughes' cell phone. To preserve his anonymity, he insisted that his phone interview with Hughes not be recorded. He theorized that the killers were conducting wicked human sacrifice rituals coinciding with pagan celebrations or the lunar calendar. According to Jeff, there was a total of approximately 11 to 16 victims, significantly more than the four officially confirmed victims. He claimed his team found a number of similarities among the cases that were highly unlikely to be purely coincidental. Who is Jeff Gannon? According to a few reports, it seems like the anonymous tipster who became a common figure in the Oakland County child killer case does in fact have a name, Jeff Gannon. Whether or not this is even an alias, though, is yet to be confirmed. In 2010, he, he under the name of Bob... Okay, so that's that. just the excerpt here is from the Cinemaholic, which is uh, I've already gone over. And the claims were dismissed, of course, due to lack of evidence. And you know what's really weird? So the plot's going to thicken even further because a person of interest in the Oakland County child killer case was Archibald Edward Sloan, a child molester who victimized young boys in his neighborhood. So there was a witness who claimed to have seen... So the this is kind of weird here. So this is from wiki2.org on the, the Oakland County child killer. So hair samples found in Sloan's 1966 Pontiac Bonneville matched hair found on the bodies of King and Stebbins, but the hair was not from Sloan himself. I don't know what that means, but that's what's listed here. A witness claimed to have seen King being abducted by two men, one described as being in his late 20s, and the other described as bearing a strong resemblance to serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who was allegedly in Michigan around the time of the killings. So, you know, what's crazy, though, of course, is the Gacy Associates and all of that that I went over in the previous episodes, the Delta Project connected to the Johnny Gosh case. Okay, so actually, regarding Sloan, in 2019, Investigation Discovery did a uh, documentary. They stated, so, in 2012, New DNA Tech found that Sloan's car contained hair with the same mitochondrial profile as evidence found in the victims, but the hair itself is not Sloan's. So somebody's hair, not Sloan's, 
that was found on the victims was found in his car. So that's the connection there to Sloan. But regarding Gacy, it doesn't end there with the coincidences. The final mind shock that we're going to finish here is that now Gannon and the subject of changing names was also involved in the John Wayne Gacy trial. Donita Ganzon, who happens to be 33 years of age. See, this is why people think this case is a psyop. I mean, you have Freemasonry all over the place. But Donita uh, Ganzon testified here. That this is uh, Rockford, Illinois, Register Star, February 9th, 1980. Emotion ran high Friday during the third day of accused mass murder of John Wayne Gacy's trial with the testimony of a transsexual and a woman brought to court in a wheelchair. Transsexual Donita Ganzon, 33, said she had been living with Timothy O'Rourke, 20, when he disappeared during the fall of 77. He went out for cigarettes one night and never returned. She said his body was later pulled from the Illinois River near Morris. Ganzon sobbed as she identified a photo of O'Rourke and another of his tattooed arm. Ganzen's admission that she was a transsexual enabled the defense to imply O'Rourke was homosexual. So, another excerpt here. Gacy witness electrifies courtroom. The first week of John Wayne Gacy's murder trial has been spiced with grisly details, emotional testimony, and Friday, a witness who shocked most of those in the courtroom. Is it Miss Ganzon? asked defense attorney Sam Amarant of witness Donita Ganzon, 33. Yes, Miss Ganzon, the witness said. What did your name used to be before you changed it to Donita? Don. How long have you been a female? Almost everyone in the courtroom gasped. Just moments before, people who had whispered how beautiful the dark-haired Filipino witness was, her long hair brushed against her shoulders, dressed in a white blouse and stylish plaid skirt, the petite witness was a striking picture. I'm in the process of being a woman, Ganzon said, anger building in her voice. When you met Tim, you weren't a woman. That's right. Have you had a sex change operation? No, I haven't. Then you're still a man. At that point, the prosecuting attorneys who had called Ganzon as a witness objected to continued questioning. Okay, kind of weird, but from the book, John Wayne Gacy, Defending a Monster, by Sam L. Amarante and Danny Broderick, what about Donita Gannon? Remember Donita Gannon? That's the little Asian registered nurse. Now you think the state came out and told you that Miss Gannon was really Mr. Ganzen? Oh no. No, they left that up to the defense. Let the defense lawyer be the bad guys. We'll put this little girl up there, say she's a registered nurse, talk about how much she misses Timothy O'Rourke, but don't say anything else. So then we have to get up and expose this poor person to the whole world. Why do we have to do that? Why do we have to look at the bad guys? Because we are concerned with the facts, the facts, the evidence. Talking about Miss Gannon, now here's a person who actually is having a sex change operation. She shouldn't have any fear, any worry, or anxiety about people thinking anything about her. Maybe she was intended to be that way. She was intended to be a female, so she's having a sex change operation. If that's what she wants to do, fine, but she should not have been afraid of it. She should not have to not want to say it on the stand. Okay. So, Ganzen changed his name to Gannon. That's an interesting thing to change one names to, especially with Gacy's connection to the Johnny Gosh case, or at least the Delta Project, which may or may not have overlapped, and other possible individuals involved in the ring who may or may not have been involved with Gacy. Now... Obviously, the coincidence stack is so stratospheric here that I'm going to have to just leave it at that for now. But this is uh, is one dark case with so many coincidences. I mean, yeah, it's just the Mind Shock listeners can jump in here and let us know what they think about all these coincidences and everything else. Hope you guys found another edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative. If you want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Support the channel that way for access to exclusive streams and chats. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patreon do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co- podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.